Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, the October 26th uh, Planning Board meeting. Before, we've got two hearings scheduled for tonight. Before we jump in, uh, we use this time of the meeting to offer up if anybody has any comments that do not uh, relate to the two hearings that are in front of us tonight, uh, we give you the opportunity to uh, have your say now. Is there anybody in the audience that wishes to speak to something other than uh, the two hearings that we're going to hear uh, about tonight. If not, we'll jump into the first hearing and scheduled for 7 o'clock. It's a site plan review for Ryan Road School basketball ball court for brighter lights at 498 Ryan Road, Florence, map ID 29-104. And we have a presentation. Yes. So we are uh, calling this project Legends Court at uh, Ryan Road Elementary School. And uh, the reason being is because the uh, charity that we put this together, we are called League Legends. And uh, we're an all-volunteer Northampton-based nonprofit. We were established in 2008. Um, we've been around for you know quite a while and kind of getting formalized in recent years. Uh, we originated in 2008 uh, following the passing of two friends of ours named David Holman and Miles Adams. They passed away shortly after high school. So friends of mine that uh, went to high school with David and Miles basketball together we decided to form a charity to raise money for their scholarships sorry can you just get your name michael o'brien yeah. michael o'brien and uh 70 acre brook drive in yep. florence too um so we uh after establishing the charity raising money for the scholarships we found you know pretty great success in what we were doing and a lot of people were coming to a charity basketball tournament they were holding so we decided to broaden our mission a little bit and start working on like community engagement and providing recreational opportunities uh, to people of Northampton. That was sort of something that was really important to us when we were in high school with David and Miles, and you know we sort of carried that on in their uh, in their name and their legacy. Um, the court itself is uh, you know unique for a few reasons. It's going to be dedicated to them. It's actually already built, um, and it's uh, going to be the only publicly lit outdoor recreational recreational space in Northampton and maybe in Hampshire County. I'm not really sure what's going on, on the other side of the river but there's really not a lot of outdoor activities available after dark. And so um, when we were in high school, that's what we used to do. We would spend time playing basketball in the dark, in like the real dark, and uh, <laughs> got the jam fingers and broken noses to prove it. So now we're trying to make a space more dedicated, more formalized for, uh, for other people to enjoy. Um, so one of the reasons that we're here is uh, we actually went through a lot of this process with the city council and the school committee, as well as the um, the superintendent, or sorry, uh, the supervisor of maintenance with the school, and they had all approved the, the court. We thought we were sort of in the clear, and we broke ground on the court. We're building, had raised the money and everything for this project, and then we, when we applied for the electrical permit, it got uh, revoked because of this ordinance, um, the chapter 350. You can see it up here. Now, what I only posted is the goals because the ordinance that was written is really steered, in my opinion, towards like parking lots and like the sides of buildings. It wasn't really aimed at you know, targeting an outdoor recreational space. And I talked to Carolyn, you had mentioned it's sort of a case by case when you do a project like this. So we're in a little bit of uncharted territory, I think. And so I just wanted to bring up the goals here because the goals are really the primary element that we targeted um, with our official design that we submitted to you. For a while, I was trying to do it off the ordinance. It's just unrealistic for a project like this to have some of that criteria for uh, a basketball court. So, you know, what's highlighted here is stuff that were, you know, very important to me as I was, you know, designing this. Uh, a little bit of a breakdown of the project. Um, you can see in a side by side without having the uh, the ordinance up itself. Um, this is sort of show you, you know, where we line up and where we don't line up. Um, so we we are um, looking at using cutoff fixtures. That's uh, sort of a standard for all of the. Um, the parking lots and the ordinance that's in place and we are adamant about having zero foot candles any any light trespass at the property line that was sort of the main criteria before we knew there was an ordinance in place we just we didn't want this the lights to be bothering anybody we wanted to just keep it focused on the property um, once we learned about the ordinance we learned you know we were in excess in a lot of other categories um, 
what we're looking at tonight is for a, a limit or an increased maximum of 20 foot candles. Um, I'll talk more about that number in great depth. Uh, and also <coughs> we need the fixture mounting angle. I have it listed as 85, basically five degrees towards vertical. So it's not uh, angled down, uh, it's angled up. I'm not sure if that's correct or if it was supposed to be 95, but five degrees up from uh, parallel to the ground. Um, the pole height that we're looking for is also 20 feet. The ordinance requires 16 feet. And the color temperature, while this is not in the ordinance right now, Carolyn, you've, you've expressed your concerns about the color temperature. And we are gonna ask for 5,000 um, as opposed to the 3,000, which you're suggesting kind of leaning towards. And I'll kind of get into why. Um, just some general details about the project. Um, it's on the slide here. Uh, City Council School, we have approved lights. I think we did things out of order here. But uh, people have been donating money to this. You know, the project's been approved from uh, some other important uh, government officials. So we're, we're sort of at a point where we're, we're now doing um, the logistics, which is what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, it's gonna have six poles, six fixtures, basically one fixture per pole, three on each side of the court. Um, the lights are gonna come on at dusk every day with the use of a light sensor. So, you know, it's gonna be automated. So whenever we get to that twilight hour and it looks like it's too hard to play basketball, they will kick on. Uh, one of the most important aspects is the lights are out at 930. And that's going to be a uh, fixed number. We've talked about it briefly with neighbors and you know other people, the school committee, all, a lot of folks have contributed. That's a number we reached, not arbitrarily. It's a number that most people are comfortable with. And you know, if you think of when the sun goes down in the summertime, you know, it sets around 830, it's still kind of twilight until about 915, 930. So it's, we're basically extending the daylight year round is what we're going to, to like the maximum. Um, we, uh, we also plan uh, right now to just turn the lights out when there's snow on the ground. We're not gonna clear the court. It's strictly a basketball court. It's not to serve as a parking lot either. So when you can't use it as a court, we're gonna turn the lights out. And that's, you know, we wanna save money. We wanna make sure that uh, we're not wasting electricity. And if it were a nuisance to anybody, it won't be during the period that no one's getting any, like no benefit from it. Um, however, uh, our long-term goal as League Legends is to increase, you know, recreation opportunities in the area. We would like to do an outdoor skating rink another unique feature here in Northampton. And so, you know, having the lights on this venue is going to afford us that option. We would be able to, you know, pull the hoops out, put an ice rink down, and then have people after school, you know, when it's too dark, be able to play hockey in, you know, Northampton, which is something that hasn't really existed for a while. And that's an idea we've talked about with the school committee. It's not definitive, but it's, uh, it's something to strive for after this project for us. So just uh, to help you understand exactly where we're looking at here, this is the, the Google image of the Ryan Road property. Um, the yellow uh, rectangle is, is where the court is already located. It's already there. Um, so we've got the Ryan Road, uh, the main road at the top here, the school adjacent to the, uh, the yellow rectangle, and probably the, most, the, the nearest abutting properties are the, uh, the Austin Circle residences. Now uh, there's a, a tree line between them where probably from the property line at least two to three hundred feet away um, and we're going to talk a little bit in depth about how the lights you know come you know near that area you can see on the far right that's the uh, the photometric about um, which we'll be discussing <clears throat> so I actually have I want to get these out to you guys it's probably gonna be a little tricky to see on the uh, slides so these are just a copy of that photometric drawing it's really I think the definitive image for our case. So if you guys want to have one, feel free and we'll talk about that in some detail. Is this the same as you submitted in the application? It is not, and I'll, I'll kind of express why. So the application, um, part of the reason the, uh, it, it might even be easier to just ignore sort of the application that I submitted. We, we went to a sprint. The, the project, I'm going on a tangent here, but it's worth mentioning. We were supposed to finish this project on October 14th. We had a dedication ceremony planned. We had contacted the families to come out and see this tribute dedicated to their past children. And when this uh, permit came down, we you know, tried to scramble in a way to get what lights we had approved to you know, make this all happen, to, to get to a finish line, to get to something that you know, we could you know, say is an adequately lit basketball court and to reach sort of the, the, the goal of getting it done this fall. Um, we learned more about the process. It, it had to go through some checks and balances. So when I submitted the application, I sort of submitted it saying, you know, here's what we have right now. I'm going to continue to look for improvements, ways to improve it. And so what I submitted to you guys in the most recent email, the one I sent you, Carolyn, is, is sort of the official design. And I'm gonna talk 
mostly about the official design. It's, it's kind of been an up and down. I'm learning this process a little bit. Um, the turnaround time was to see if we could get this done sooner. Uh, we have now accepted that this timeline is not going to happen, so we're looking to do it in the spring when the lights get installed. So if there's any questions or concerns about the design tonight, you know, we are working at your pace now. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, the fixtures and angle. It's one of the first things, the ordinance that are worth talking about. So these are your standard sort of shoebox fixtures here. Uh, we're looking for 235 watt full cutoff, which is a requirement uh, set at that 85 degree angle. That's something that's a little different. Now, this is something that's sort of unavoidable when you're using an open space recreational field. Uh, we tried, and I think the first design I sent you showed fixtures at a 90 degree angle, and I'll talk about why that's not effective anymore. Um, the fixtures that we're looking at, these are really, really specialized. These are a little extra expensive, more expensive. I'm going to sort of touch on some of the, the components that are a little more expensive because we are trying to reach the goals that the city has. We're willing to pay more money to do that to get this approved. So one of them is to buy these lights where the LEDs inside are actually angled within the fixture. So they actually allow, they use the expression throwing the light. You could throw the light in a more targeted direction. So they would sit as basically low as they can as far as an angle and they would throw the light in the direction of the court. So it allows for less light trespass backwards. It allows for a little more uh, light in the direction that you're targeting, um, but it still was not enough at a 90 degree angle. Uh, what we kept running into is what you see on the left of your screen. Um, this is what's tricky about this ordinance. Uh, in a parking lot or on a building, you can always add more lights. You can you know, rearrange how the parking lot is. We cannot change the dimensions of a basketball court. We can't put any lights in the middle of the court. So we're kind of stuck with this trench of darkness down the middle. Um, and this is at the 90 degree fixture angle, 16 foot poles. This is kind of like what you would see for a, uh, a court that's within the ordinance minus the foot candles, which we'll talk about. Uh, the thing is, we're looking to get 15 foot candles in the middle. That's like the lowest end, and that's sort of what you have in front of you there. We're a little under that. I think, honestly, this design might be a little underdone, and I'll touch on that later, but we really want this to happen. Um, but 15 foot candles is probably the absolute, absolute low end to play basketball. And right now, the three foot candles is the maximum. That's what the parking lots are sort of lit as. It's not safe. It's not you know, usable. It's, it's a deterrent for people to come out and use recreational space. So it would be sort of uh, an unnecessary cost to, we would probably not be able to, we probably wouldn't put in lights if we weren't able to get the foot candles extended. That's, that's one that's just sort of essential. Um, and these numbers are not arbitrary. I mean, 15 is something we kind of, you know, searched for constantly. I've evaluated a number of different uh, other venues and stuff like that. And I'll touch on that in a second. But uh, 15 foot candles is sort of the absolute low end. Um, we're asking for 20 because just the way the light works, um, you know, we need 20 foot candles maximum underneath the light poles. You can kind of see uh, closer to the sidelines, we're up around 20. And that allows for the 15, you know, 15 ish in the middle in that trench of darkness. That's also where probably the most intense play is in basketball. If you don't know the sport, it's, it's very engaged around the middle of the court, especially around the hoops. And admittedly, I still think we're a little low where we really, really want to be. Now, we've played around with different amounts of light posts. We've played around with you know, different layouts. Um, we're trying very, very hard to work sort of within the goals and guidelines of the city. And this is why I think this is sort of the best compromise, the best design. One thing that's really unique about this, the one I submitted tonight, Carolyn, versus the one that you guys might have seen before, is uh, the, the contrast is, is much more decreased. I think the one I submitted before, it had about 10 foot candles in the middle, which was not ideal. But additionally, because the fixtures were at a 90 degree angle, it was really concentrated light directly below them. So you'd have about 25, 26 foot candles in those areas. And so now what is 10 foot candles looks even darker because it's contrasted against the concentrated light on the sideline. This design is really, really fluid. It actually looks pretty good. And I'll show you one picture later on where it allows for, you know, pretty much equal lighting all around, give or take four or five foot candles. And so that's really, really helpful because I think we're operating at too low a level of light. I'm not sure, but I really, you know, I, I want to sort of abide by what the goals of the city are. But, you know, if we have a fluid sort of, you know, set up design, I think the transitions to people's eyes will be able to adjust and play in this venue. Um, maybe a little out of order, but this is the most important one. Uh, the zero foot candles at the property line. We want to be good neighbors. We really are uh, doing everything in our power to make sure that this is not a burden for anyone in the neighborhood. And 
So this is an illustration to sort of prove that. So what you're looking at on the slide, and you can see it on your laminate too, um, we are at 0.1 foot candles at the tree line, um, that shaded area uh, right where the blue kind of comes. That's actually shadow. This is a Google image. So if you see the, the clear Google image, the tree line starts where it says 0 0.1, and uh, we're still about 100 no feet. Leaves, What's that? You ain't going to have any leaves when they're running. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, I, I understand. But we're, we're at zero at the property line, and, and I appreciate that. Like, I, we, we are very conscious of what we're getting. We're not going to have light overflowing the property line, which is a minimum of the ordinance, which is the sole criteria that we sort of, you know, started with when we decided to put lights in. <clears throat> I'm going to scan back really quickly. I should have mentioned this. When we thought about, you know, we, we went through many, many steps. We've talked about many, many uh, areas in Northampton to put this court. Uh, probably should have run it by you guys sooner. We chose Ryan Road because there's already farm league baseball. There's already football that goes on in the evening. We picked the most central spot at Ryan Road so that we were sort of as far away from everyone as possible. We're also in a little bit of a dip. There's a raise in almost every direction. Austin Circle is about the same plane. So we were very conscious of these things moving forward. I don't know where else in town that we could have done this. We talked about Mains Field. We talked about Vets Field. We talked about Sheldon Field. Sheldon Field is going under construction in a few years, and we wanted to get this project done now. We may actually partner in that project in the future, but this was the best option. Um, so zero foot candles at the, uh, at the property line. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention and again, a little bit of a tangent in the uh, discussion tonight. Sarah Madden, the uh, principal of Ryan Road, has been really uh, an integral part of this project. And one thing she wanted to speak to is, is there's actually been a lot of vandalism at Ryan Road in that area lately. Uh, it's sort of a younger crowd. It's just petty vandalism. It's nothing, you know, excessive. And they have uh, surveillance cameras coming in, something the city's already approved. They're spending a lot of money on. None of those uh, cameras are, are night vision. It's all going to be, you know, based on the light available. Where we're putting this court right now, there's, there's no lights at all. It's like the dark side of the school. So on top of being you know, a basketball court, these lights will also aid in the surveillance cameras. It'll light up an area where there is sort of already vandalism. Um, the venue itself, hopefully, you know, with more people coming to it, acts as a deterrent because now it's more of a public space. And then additionally, um, where you see there's some cars in the image already, it is currently a parking lot with no lights. And it's already been a parking lot for the farm leagues and for the football practices that end at dark. And there's no light there right now. So it's also going to aid that people being able to get to their cars with, you know, better lighting. So it's sort of a bonus. You know, I think it's worth, you know, giving credit to the lights and the design that, you know, it's going to help more than it's going to hinder in that area. Um, getting back to where we were. Uh, one thing that's really important to me is that this project is compared to other recreational spaces and not the ordinance. When I first started, when we first got hit with the ordinance and I scrambled to get a new design, I was trying to do everything as close to the ordinance as possible and it's not realistic. So what now I'm trying to do is trying to reference the standards set by other facilities around here and then work down from there to get as close to the ordinance. And it, it helped a lot. It came out with a better design. So the standard for a lot of the foot candles at basically any high school venue, any, any athletic venue, um, I think I believe the MIA, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, requires you to be at 50 foot candles to use that athletic space. So the Northampton High School football field is at 52 foot candles. This is done on an app on my phone. I'm sure it's a give or take on a few foot candles, but it's a, a pretty good ballpark. Uh, the other venue in town, the only other lit venue, it's not a public space besides what we have at Smith College and Look Park, is uh, 48 foot candles at Maine Softball Field in Florence. And I know they recently redid the lights there, but that's where we're reading at Maine's Field. And, you know, working our way down, you can see the Legends Court is at 20 foot candles. We are scaling dramatically down in an effort to get this approved um, still, while still sort of making this, you know, good for the play, good for its use. Uh, the best comp is probably Holyoke High School basketball court. Um, I'll bring up a picture later on. They did it in a really different way, but they're at 38 foot candles. That's really the only lit basketball court relatively nearby. There might be a few in Springfield. Um, and then just for reference, you know, if you can wrap your head around it, like the Walmart parking lot entrance as you're going in, that's around 36 foot candles. Um, 20 foot candles, a few of the gas stations when you're pumping your gas are around 20 foot candles. Just sort of, you know, get some perspective as to what we're talking about. Um, obviously, that's an environment that has a lot of reflected light, too, so it kind of makes it seem brighter than what we're actually going to end up with. 
Uh, one thing worth mentioning, I you know took readings. So the Ryan Road School parking lot, which is where there's some basketball hoops where people have played basketball before, it's at two foot candles. It might be three foot candles. Again, I, the sensor might be off. I know that's what you guys said the parking lot lights are in town. But that's, I'll show you a picture in a little bit of what that looks like. There are security lights on the back side of Ryan Road that are, they're a little old. I think they're filament um, type of fixtures. And those are also angled upwards. And those are at 10 foot candles. So we're not going to be like, you know, grossly contrasting what's already on the property. There's already sort of a little bit of a precedent there. Um, So this is actually a little side by side uh, picture on the left is of Holyoke basketball court taken in the rain. So it's not the best image, but this is around that 38 foot candles. And the one on the right is uh, closer to, this is the one at Ryan Rose, the existing parking lot here. This is the, um, the three, two to three foot candles there. Um, you can see this pretty dramatic difference here. Uh, it's not playable at Ryan Road. It's, it's something that we have tried to play and it's, it's not suitable. Three foot candles just sort of out of reach. The whole other court, I wish I had sort of, I wish I'd show the other picture, I think. Um, what they have at Holyoke is basically like stadium lighting. And I think that's what I see at a lot of other courts that have done this. I used to live out on the eastern side of the state and they have some courts like this. And they have basically a 30 foot pole. And at the top are three gigantic floodlights. Their strategy was let's make it tall, let's make it bright and hope it's enough. And that's what they sort of did. That was their approach. There's actually really big contrasting shadows. Like the corners are around six to eight foot candles. In the middle, we're at that 38 mark. So it's not a, it's not a great design. However, that's the way most of these courts are designed is, you know, make it tall, make it bright. So I just want to sort of point out that we have sort of made a concerted effort to go away from that, you know, approach and really be detailed and thoughtful on this. Um, coming on to the home stretch here. Uh, one of the things is not in the uh, ordinance right now, but Carolyn, you, you've expressed it, and I, I just want to <coughs> um, about the, the color temperature of the lights. Um, so you've, you've done the research. You, you've you're saying the science of saying that this 5,000K is, is sort of detrimental to the environment. It's bad for people's eyes. It's bad for sort of the ecosystem in the air. We do have, you know, I'm conscious of that. I, I come from a science background. I respect the science. I, I would like to avoid being in that 5,000 K threshold as well. That is sort of the standard for most sports lighting. Um, what I would like to do is try to get around 4,500, um, which is a weird number. We would have to pay more money for that, but I think we can do it. Um, the reason I want to stay out of the, the lower end of the range is, is just for the, the simple fact, and, and you guys know this already, but it's, it's ambient lighting. It's, it's not really task lighting. And basketball is de definitely requires task lighting. I mean, you need to be able to differentiate the color of the jerseys. You need to be able to tell the lines meet and end, and it's just essential that we have, you know, that brighter, higher color temperature so we can have a more definitive contrast. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, we're, we're going to make an effort to make that happen, but the, the 3000K is just not appropriate for that space. So uh, one more additional option. Uh, this is something to consider. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's something that we're, we're willing to do if you think it'll help. Um, we're willing to put in motion sensors that can be added to the basketball court. So when the court is not being a court, you know, this whole design is based around this is what a basketball court needs. But when no one's using this court, it can be as close to the ordinance as possible. Um, basically, it'll be uh, at like 90% restriction. So when no one's on the court, instead of being at 20 foot candles, we'll be at two foot candles. We'll be at one foot candle where it's 10 rough numbers, but we will, we will scale it back so that it is simply lit to say, hey, the lights are on if you want to use it. So until 930, those will be on. And then when someone steps in the court, they'll go to the full effect. And then when it comes to 930, everything's going off. So there's no more light there anymore. Um, it's maybe worse. I don't know. You know, uh, we've got neighbors here. Um, maybe the on and off is more uh, of a nuisance. I don't know. Uh, but it's an option to consider. Obviously, it can serve some power. Um, it it uh, you know, makes the point that this is a basketball court. When it needs to be a basketball court, it's not when it's not. Um, it's obviously another mechanism that can go wrong. So for that reason, it's maybe questionable to use. But So in conclusion, thanks for letting me ramble. Um, this design is the absolute minimum needs of the basketball court. And I really, really mean that. I, it's not like I'm coming in here with the strongest offer that I can get and then, and then knowing that we're going to negotiate down. If we're negotiating down, 
it really comes into question. I don't know that we can light this basketball court. It just doesn't seem like it's appropriate to do it scaled back. And obviously, there's a chain reaction. If there's a restriction in one area, I believe it's going to have an effect in another area. So if you were to lower the poles, we might have to change the angle. If you were to lower the light, you know, that one's almost impossible. Um, I, I really, I, I think sometimes this project along this way has been viewed as sort of a nuisance. This, this thing could be really, really important for this community. It really could. It's, it's going to be a public light of recreational space. This doesn't exist. That's unique. That's unique to the county, I believe. I really think that it's something that would be really, really valuable to people that are stuck at work all day. They get out of work and they don't have a place to go to spend time with their friends, to have an outlet for better health. This is a mission that's really important to me. I, uh, I think it's also going to be a great resource. I think, you know, I think this is actually, Northampton likes to be a very progressive town. I think this is a way that we should maybe consider heading. I mean, you have limited space for athletic fields. You, you want to have a lot of conservation land. You want to use a lot of space for other things. I think we just look to maximize the time we can get out of those recreational spaces. I think we kind of take back the night a little bit. So I think this is sort of that early first step in that direction. Um, you know, the weather has been crazy. You know, when it's 95 degrees out, you don't want to play basketball. But when it's 80 degrees at night, maybe you do. Um, the mosquitoes are a big issue too. You know, this gets us past that daylight, twilight, hot period. It's something I do think we're actually heading towards, and I think this is a really good first step. Um, I, I got to say it again. I'm, I'm worried. You know, this this design is done on the low end. There's a really good chance that if you approve this tonight, I'll be back in a couple years saying I screwed up. We need more light. Um, <laughs> We did it on the low end because it's important to get this pushed through. This is sort of the finish line of a long, long period for our group. And it would be a major setback to hear that it's not going to go through at this point. Um, and I think the last point, it's, it's important. Uh, the lights are out at 930. So all the issues that may come up about having lights, they don't matter after 930. I mean, we're, we're trying to operate in winter. We're trying to spend the daylight. We're trying to make something new and special. And I think it'll be good. Think you should give it a chance. So that is sort of it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions by the board? Yes. Yeah. Who did the um, Who did the design? I did. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons uh, we've been able to keep costs down here is we didn't pay for designer. Probably why we are here tonight doing this after the fact because someone else might have intervened and said that. Um, but you know, we want to keep costs down. Low overhead has sort of always been our strength. Our, our strength at League Ledger has always been hustle. We just hustle. We just make things happen. We make mistakes along the way. This is one of them. But we work hard to over to, to reset it and get back. Um, also, additionally, <coughs> too, uh, because we were able to do the design ourselves without uh, help from the city, we were actually able to do this project without the prevailing wage, which is something that's really, really important. It, it kept costs down for us. And I think it makes us a really, really valuable resource to the city in the future, kind of proving to you that we can do this in sort of a little bit of a private sector, but partnering with the city, we could be an amazing resource for you in the future to say, hey, we want to have this happen over there. You know, can you guys help with this project, do a little bit of the rough designing, we'll give you our feedback, and you guys oversee it, and we can do it at a much lower cost, <coughs> make much sooner. And I think that's a really, really great resource that we could be for the city. Um, didn't work out perfectly this time. Uh, probably should have checked in with you guys sooner. But uh, we were able to do it at a significantly less cost without the prevailing wage. And that's a resource that I know holds you back from doing a lot of projects as well. So looking for the future and partnerships, I think, keep us in mind. Yeah. And do you have a question? Mm -mm. No. So I have a question. Um, and I don't know if you have the answer. So the difference between 4,500 and 5,000, mm -hmm. what does that actually what does that mean? I mean, this is, this is the 5, one area. might as well, if you're going to do it, just do it. Yeah. Well, so this is, I, I believe, maybe it's not the best graphic for it. So it's listed as cool white, neutral white, warm white. You can almost think of it as like orange, white, blue. Really simplifying this a little bit. That blue light is that light that you get from your phone. That's the stuff, that's the artificial light that, you know, messes with your hormones and just leads, you know, to sort of a less healthy, um, you know, environment and well-being for people. Uh, yes, Carolyn, you might want to touch on this more than I do. So 4,500 is just outside of that bluish range and closer to, it's, it's a brighter white. And white is where we want to be because the contrast is more defined and more clear. The orange light blends a lot of colors, especially hot colors tend to blend. And if you're playing sports, 
you know, it's it's tricky to see against skin tones of basketball against a jersey and stuff like that. I, I get that. I'm asking. All right, I get. I don't know if I get that, but um, I is five thousand going to be more obnoxious to neighbors? No. Than forty five hundred. Okay. I, well, I I can't speak for them. They, they'll speak to that. I, I don't. Mean, I, I don't think personally, so. Personally, I mean the the health the health of playing basketball counts more to me than any of the other environmental factors. So the, the standard the I'd standard want better ba I'd want better lighting. I played basketball as a kid, so. I don't, I don't know that there's, uh, I think it would be hard to, I mean, 5,000 is the standard for daylight. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, I don't think, I think Michael mentioned that it's not, um, it's not common to have a 4,500. So <laughs> that's like, and so I'm not sure that the, I think, I think you may be on to something that maybe the cost of dropping it by 500 yeah, may that's not what even I'm be <laughs> enough to really make a big difference, right. but the cost may be. Yeah, well, I'm just, I mean. Because it's not a standard it, number. It, it, this project seems like a great project, and, and of course there's another side to, to it, but i just not sure that it makes, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do the project, you do the project. I would agree. 5,000 is, and I'm just, I just don't know if 500 I get the difference between 5,000 and 3,000. That I get. Yeah. I'm just not sure that there's a difference between 4,500. Right. <laughs> you, you mentioned MIAA standards. Do they have a, a light color temperature? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the daylight lighting. It's, you know, and, and typically, a lot of the sporting venues, um, I mentioned about Holyoke, they all have that flood lighting effect, too. So it's, it's just blatant, blatant blanket, like throw the brightest lights you can at it. And that blue lighting, I, I keep calling it blue lighting, the daylighting is is where there might be a concern, but that is the standard for sports. Um, I think you get a little bit more foot candles out of the blue lighting too. So if we were to scale back to 4,500, there actually may be a loss in overall brightness too. Um, but you're probably right, between five and, and 4,500. 4,500 is actually an unknown, so it'd be sort of experimental. But I'm, my pitch on that was to say, we're willing. We're trying to work here to, to make it, you know, whatever's more comfortable. So 4,500, if that's, if that, is important to anyone on this panel. We're willing to, to make that stride, um, but I think below 4,500 is, is where we're diminishing the ability to play basketball well to, to be appropriate for, you know, the uh, the task. Okay. Any other questions by the board? Okay, we're going to open this up. Uh, thank you, Michael. We're going to open this up to a public comment. <clears throat> if you could raise your name, I'll call on you uh, and come up to the podium and state your name and address, and we'll go through everybody once. Uh, before we do somebody twice, yep. My name is Robert Kolakowski. I'm a direct of butter to the school, and I'm, I'll be right in back of the place. Uh, the whole nature of the school has changed over the years. It started out as an elementary school. My kids have gone to school. My grandchildren are going to school there now. As soon as the high school gets out, the little kids no longer have a place to play because it's dominated by the high school kids. Later on in the evening, it's dominated by teenagers in cars. Uh, it's not the quiet little reserved space that everybody likes to think of. There is no facilities there for any kind of wash up or anything else. Uh, they had uh, porta -potties. potties brought in because my wife complained about seeing all the tushes all the time. Okay, and I don't see that changing. Now I, I, I like the idea that he wants to honor his friend and it doesn't need the sports. But as you drive through my area, you'll find dozens of the sidewalk basketball hoops for the driveways sticking out in the road. And the reason they're there is because they cannot use the school, par the school parking lot basketball hoops because they're being used by the older kids. So what do they have to do? They have to either do their own or fight with the big kids to get it. And I've always, always thought that when dust comes, the schools are supposed to be vacated. Now he's going to add an exception to that. And uh, 9 o'clock is a much fairer one if you decide to go that way. 9.30 is, is far and away. And as far as the light temperature, what is the temperature of the lights in here? Would you play basketball in here and complain about it? So there you go. I mean, uh, I understand his idea, but it's really rushed through. They took part of the school playground. The kids have less area to play. I have no idea where they're going to put the snow now because that's the area where they used to put the snow. So, and 
as far as I'm concerned, it was rushed through and it was relatively ill-conceived. Although I, it is needed, but the people who are gonna use it aren't gonna be from the area and the little kids are gonna suffer for it. And that's all I have to say Thank about it. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Diane Lake. I live right in the back of the school. My deck looks at the basketball court. I bought my home almost 40 years ago with it being a grammar school, not a recreation department facility. Um, when kids got out of school, you would think 3.30, whatever, most of the kids are gone. Um, then they started after day programs, after school programs, which is fine. They're little kids, love them to pieces. I've got grandkids. But then we go from that to three baseball diamonds, which is going until dark. Um, then we have football practice when that's over and you hit it, hit it, hit from the coaches until actually it goes after dark because they put their headlights on and flood the fields. The parents line up in a row with their cars. Now we got the basketball court, which we know about headlights. Um, he was fanning my bedroom with his headlights through the window, hitting my mirror, and splashing it everywhere in my house. Yeah, that was during the middle of construction. I didn't realize yeah. you can't do construction. Well, I called the police department at 10. Uh, they went over and I was told, they told him to kill the lights and he said he would only be another 10 or 15 minutes. Well, a little after midnight, I called the police department back and said, okay. Ma'am, I, I appreciate happened? that, but we're, we're past that now. We're here, we're here for this Well, I, I'm so. against this all the way. I'm in a bedroom community with a grammar school. If you want to build basketball courts, you want to put in hockey or ice hockey afterwards. Now we're talking about all year long. I'm at the age, I've raised my kids, I've raised my grandchildren for the most part. I want peace and quiet on my deck. I don't want to hear the <coughs> language from 15 year olds to 20 something year olds. They're, they're not nice. <coughs> they've got a foul mouth. I don't need to hear it. And I hear that now even. That basketball court that's at the front of Ryan Road School, that's not in my backyard, I hear them. They're playing out there now. When I came in, there was five or six guys out there hooping and hollering. We get the kids that are playing with their cars doing donuts out there. <coughs> I've talked to the chief of police about the noise out there. You think lights are going to be a deterrent to them hooping and hollering? It's just going to light up the way for them. There's been more vandalism at that school in almost 40 years, and I know for a fact what was going on over there. This isn't gonna stop, you're opening up a door. You're an invitation, come play with the school. It's a bedroom community. There's Sheldon Field, there's Mains Field, there's the new field that, that, where they're playing, walking through up on Meadow Street. Why couldn't it have been built there? You got a river, you got woods. The woods between me and the school is nothing. And when leaves disappear, it's even worse. I mean, I can look on my deck and I can tell what color their shirts are, and I need glasses. So, I mean, this is all okay. pathetic. I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm against it all the way. Okay. And people on Austin Circle were not notified in the beginning of this. We, this is the first postcard that we received. Yeah. on any of this. Okay. I don't think it's right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So um, Mark Nee, James, 47 High Street in Florence. Also law office down on Con Street, 90 Con Street. Um, former member of uh, planning board for five years and also the zoning board for five years. And I realize when you're sitting here judging, looking at the criteria and trying to judge against a set of facts and you're trying to look at a project that sometimes it's difficult to do I guess I really wanted to emphasize the fact that the design standards are more for parking lots and gas stations and it's not really set up to judge a basketball court or recreational facility so I think when you're considering this whole project and I'm in favor of it um, 
uh, when you're considering this whole project, <coughs> you do have to take into account that, that the ordinance doesn't really address itself to athletic facilities. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that ha having um, uh, raised two boys in the city and the, the a number of recreational f facilities in the city is is very is lacking. So I mean, any any additional recreational space for teenagers uh, or even grade school kids is uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. <clears throat> My uh, name is Lonnie Kaufman. I live at 217 Cardinal Way. Uh, I'm here as an interested uh, resident of Northampton and I'm also the uh, Northampton Public Schools Ward 6 School Committee representative. Um, I'll say I'm, I'm quite honored to be here to support um, the tremendous work that League Legends has brought to our city, not only in this particular situation, but in kind of following their work throughout the last few years in terms of a nonprofit. They, they exemplify, I think, some of the great things that we, we that, a, that a nonprofit organization can do. And in, the, in this specific situation, I am, I am very much in support of an outdoor recreational uh, facility, opportunity where people can enjoy. Uh, playing recreation into the evening for free. Um, one of the aspects that didn't come up is that the Y, other high school, other places that people can go to at night tend to cost money or there's memberships. This will be a free opportunity. Um, the other thing that uh, Mr. O'Brien didn't bring up is that these courts are actually uh, adjustable courts. They're the only, the only adjustable courts at Ryan Road. So if you go there during the daytime, you'll see the little kids out in recess because it drops down. They could pretend they they're LeBron James and slam dunk, even though they can't. But anyway, it makes it much easier, as, as many of you know, I think, for little kids to be able to reach the rim. Um, people have been playing basketball on Ryan Road for a long time, typically with their lights on. I didn't know it was a nuisance, but um, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and that shouldn't have happened. This is obviously, um, you know, the, the facts, the, the, Michael went on about the, the level of detail that this has involved is, I think, pretty stellar. I think his level of attention to um, going through the proper channel to <coughs> the community, I think, has been great. I've talked to him a number of times about this. If there's been any mistakes, he's, he'll be the first one to stand up and take that. But um, really, this looks to me like an incredible opportunity. I can fantasize and dream about Northampton having, out, having an outdoor skating rink okay. with parents and little kids okay. skating in the evening. Um, it should be tremendous. When nobody is playing basketball, maybe the slightest space could be used for other school events or community events, outdoor shows or cultural festivities or whatever as appropriate. But as a school committee member, um, we knew about this. We accepted this uh, unanimously. We approved this. Um, I believe the city council did as well. Schools, in my mind, are centers of communities. Um, they're active. They're lively. They're youthful. And um, if we can extend that that period of day, um, have lights on, bring more families out. I think it'll probably be a deterrent to some of the kids that are there now, which is troublesome to us. And we're looking at different avenues to pursue that. I know the principal's right on top of it. But at the same time, lights is lights that's going to bring out families, lights that's going to deter people from the kind of problems that we're now having with graffiti and whatnot, I think will be a help. So I think this has clearly been done with the utmost concern. I think this is um, very noble that it's honoring two friends. And I think that uh, for the betterment of the community members who wish to have outdoor funds, even if get, after it gets a little bit dark at night, um, I just hope that you can celebrate with us this great opportunity to really, um, uh, for all Northampton residents to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Just who hasn't spoken yet? Am I? Yeah. Public comment? Sure. Uh, I was at one of the uh, meetings recently with uh, the rec to, with the planning board that the rec department put on to talk about, you know, ways the community can get together and, and help with the bike trails and some of the other projects in town. Um, met Wayne Fiden there, and Wade Fiden talked about what you guys are looking for in a partner and, and what is really valuable to the community. And I think League Legends might just be the the rising star that could be really helpful for this town. So League Legends founded in 2008. It's all volunteer. Not a cent goes to anyone in there. Um, we are uh, now a 501c3 charity, so everything's tax exempt. We're eligible for grants, so we haven't really gone that route, but that's something we're going to pursue. Um, we've proven, you know, I think ourselves as capable in a, in a number of ways. The project as it stands right now looks pretty good at Ryan Road. Um, 
also, you know, we've shown that we can do this without the prevailing wage, which is a really valuable asset. I think what might be our greatest strength is our youth. I am the oldest member at 28. Um, we've been around for 10 years, and I'm, you know, 10 years under my belt of experience. But it's it's the folks that are on the other end of it that are really keeping me involved and enthused. We have uh, most of our contributing members are 24 or under, and a big chunk of them are teenagers. Um, this is actually one of the best things that we're doing. Is it's it's coming from honestly, it's coming out of the North Haven Public School System directly giving back to the community. It's something that we're actually growing with, and you know, there's a lot of shelf life on us left if if we feel like we're you know getting the support and, and the backing of of the city and, and so far we have it's going well but you know we're we're very nervous about tonight so just want to mention that to you we, we want to be you know a, 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 an important member of the community for a long time to come but you know this this hurdle might be a tough one to overcome for us so thank, thank you. you for that yep yep thanks bob kolakoski again yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody notices here that everybody who is for this project is nowhere near the place. That's right. They are very much removed from all the area. He happens to be a couple streets away, and I, I, I sympathize with him, and I, I understand what he wants to do. And I, it is inconvenient for me to have that there and for my, my kids and my grandchildren. And, you know, like 9 o'clock at... I can see something like that with the light dimmers, because uh, I I don't want that to become a problem area. Yeah, if you think the light dimmers are helpful, sir. Yeah, the there. conversation should be here. Yes, and, 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 and I I I understand his feelings for the matter, and I'd like to be sensitive too, but by the same token, everybody who pushes the thing is not in a butter, and I feel we were short shifted because we never found out about anything, till it was far too late to have any input in the in the project. Thank you. Yes. The question I have, Diane, like here. Um, the question I have is, what is the difference in the criteria for the city between being a s grammar school and recreation department? Is there a difference? Does it have to be zone different? Did the permits pulled? I mean, all of a sudden we went from a grammar school to playing fields at a at a school. It's it's accessory to a school, and it's a community use. It's a city-owned property, so um, it's allowed. <coughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, in other words, so th whatever the city wants to do with their property, it's okay. They don't have to change plans. But if I want to change, it's within the zoning. It fits in the zoning. Mm -hmm. Well, if I knew that, I would have never bought my house. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted 40 years ago. It was quiet. It was nice. And this is good. if you're talking about basketball in summer or spring, whatever, and then going into an ice cream or hockey, there's no peace and quiet for us old folks. Okay. So what do we need to do? Move into a wrinkle ranch? Yeah. Tax, tax Any other comments from the public? All right, so we'll leave uh, public comment open a little bit as we discuss. And then <clears throat> we're gonna talk amongst <coughs> ourselves for a little bit, and then I'm gonna close public comment when we do that. There's no more back and forth, so if you could please honor that um, situation. So, any comments? I'd sort of like some clarity on what regulations yeah, are TV. being butted up against but not quite gotten to, or whatever we're, what the parameters that we're dealing with are. Can you explain for us and, and the public mm -hmm. <coughs> sure. why, why we're talking about this in the first place. So, um, the zoning um, ordinance in 2000, well, for a long time, there was some basic lighting um, requirements within the zoning. In 2007, it was completely revamped, and there was very much more specificity for lighting standards depending on the zone. So residential in the outlying areas had uh, lower level right light requirements. Um, sports lighting, stadium lighting, and the like were not um, identified in the zoning, I think, because most of the new uses that would be coming on or retrofitted uses are really related to commercial uses in the commercial district or residential um, institutional uses and, and the like. And all of the sports facilities that had lighting, Smith College, um, the high school, already had lights in place. There wasn't really an anticipation that that was gonna be a constant need to address. So, but there is a provision in, this, in the lighting um, section that indicates that if, if an applicant wants to 
install lighting that exceeds the basic levels that were identified for each district. That triggered a site plan permitting review process by the planning board. Smith College did that a number of years ago. They've actually come back and done it twice, actually once for their field hockey field. They needed to upgrade their, um, they had a brand new field. It was gonna be televised um, <laughs> field or television ready. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to meet the NCAA standards for that lighting. So they came to you with, um, because again, they exceeded that. We didn't have a standard for um, athletic fields. We're staff on the staff levels in the process of um, rewriting the ordinance, updating it. The technology has changed a whole lot since 2007. Plus, we know a lot more. There's been a lot more research out there about um, how things should be potentially targeted. I will tell you in that draft, again, we're sort of passing on sports lighting at the, t at the moment. I mean, it hasn't gone through public process. You guys haven't even seen it. But the idea is that it's it's probably so site specific and sport specific that it doesn't make sense to put in a standard for athletic facilities because they're gonna be different variables mm -hmm. at different locations. So um, that the, the reason they're in front of you again is that they don't meet the standards for which the zoning was written, but there was a, an out in the zoning to allow them to come through this process. And you've seen it before mm -hmm. by Smith College. So can I ask a question? This, uh, this map here, yep. um, so I guess there's some tree line, which I guess <coughs> helps, helps the neighbors. In your, I mean, I, I get why having a car, you know, shining lights into people's houses, that's really obnoxious. Would this, sort of, I mean, with your knowledge of lights, would this help that? I mean, with the... Well, before <coughs> the lights were shining, yeah, that, now the lights... That's why I... That's now they're horrible. three and three shining this way. Yeah, yeah. Going at you this way. So, I mean, would this be better for yeah, the neighbors? Yeah. That's right, what I'm we'll asking. Used as a, I mean, there'll still be... I'm just going to pull up the aerial mm -hmm. here just to make sure. Um, you know, there's still part of the parking lot can see it within this blue see the numbers region here yeah. okay. that will still their cars will still come yeah but they won't be parking in this other section that is now paid or was previously yeah. paved for parking um, so in that respect yes it will minimize the number of cars that will be pulling in and potentially um, shed you know shining headlights yeah. in towards the neighborhood I mean, a temporary thing you can't solve I mean right. that's yeah but Assuming that people politely turned off their their lights, right. and maybe a sign would be, you know, a sign would be a, a helpful thing. Um, the, it's not enforceable, right? Well, I, I get it. I mean, it's not enforceable, but it's you know, <laughs> politeness. Um, it seems like this would be better for this. Uh, I mean, basketball is being played here. It just seems like it'd be better for the community if you had these lights that were concentrated on here versus people just setting up their car and shining lights mm -hmm. over. Does, on the lights, does anyone have an issue with the height of the poles or the angle of the lights? I mean, again, I, I think it's all about if you're going to allow it and it's not going to be a problem for the neighbors, um, I think you, you will you maximize the use. And it, you know, you maximize the use. To me, the bigger issue is not that it's the it's the nine versus the nine thirty. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. grew up. No one was well, no one was supposed to call after nine. Everyone <laughs> knew that. <laughs> um, and I personally think that that he's that uh, I'm am sorry, I forget what is the uh, gentleman. Um, he, the that, yeah, the neighbor Richard. Richard uh, I think he's correct. Oh, nine th nine thirty is too too late. Um, and uh, but I think nine o'clock is is a polite. I, I, I might be inclined since this is is kind of precedent setting yeah. um, but I agree with so many things about this project yep. uh, that you, we might um, put a condition on it that it's nine o'clock and if they want to come back in a year or two years and ask for 930 that's fine. yep but, but just, I'd rather start low and mm -hmm. then start high and, and be a problem up the bat Dan yeah I'm, my my initial 
So I appreciate the, you know, the intent and the enthusiasm. I, I'm not sure I've seen really a good communication or adherence to procedure or respect for, you know, for the neighbors. And, and I find that to me is concerning going forward. Um, and to have to make multiple calls to the police. Um, again, youthful enthusiasm. I was 28 once, too. I can't really remember. It's a long time ago. Um, but, but that bothers me. And the second thing that I'm concerned about and that I, I think might be a condition is that the lighting design should be reviewed by a professional um, and with a recommendation come back. I don't know if that's typically you know, whether we're typically having lighting design done by not an architect or an engineer. Is so that? This, this foot candle layout, this isn't by you, this is by the manufacturer, the lighting? Yeah, so we don't have a, a licensed designer doing this, but the, the actual photometric protocol that's done by a lighting company, that is a professional that has helped with that's not okay. me and Microsoft yeah. Paint doing right. it. So he's, he's sort of outlined it based okay. on the criteria that I submitted. I misunderstood. I, yeah, I, no, I thought you were so playing around with <laughs> with something with your Samsung Galaxy. Um, the other, th you know, we get concerned about parking lots and people's headlights shining into windows all the time and we require screening. I feel like in order to have this light island in the, right next to this neighborhood, we should be thinking the same way and it requesting that there be some visual screen uh, for um, for the neighbors, something that would be evergreen and not you know this part year foliage uh, screening, and, and that might also cut back on some of the noise uh, for these folks as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think nine nine p.m. is better than nine thirty, but the reality is, if at nine o'clock it goes off and people are in the middle of a game, they will flip their lights on and it will continue to go on until the game or until they're done. And so I, I, I agree, but jump ahead to 9.30 and it's the same argument. If I'm, you're halfway I'm through the game at 9.30. I'm jumping back to 8.30, oh, okay. I'll say. <laughs> you know. Can you speak to the time? Because it, it's good everyone's here talking about the time. It, it really is. Yeah. Um, the reason we said all 9.30 is because we're going to have you know, uh, leagues there at some point, like basically at cost leagues. That's what we're working towards. And so the games would end at 9, so that affords us a small cushion if the game goes later, if there's a little bit of bad weather. That's really the reason we said all 9.30, so it's, it's fairly arbitrary. I will say, however, though, in June and May, like it's pretty light out until about those times. So I don't know if we have to have a fix. Maybe we extend it a little bit more during the summer hours or on week weekends. I don't know. I can work to find out if, if there's different parameters we can set. I, you know, I, I want that to be comfortable for people. The the Ryan Road, Ryan Road's already used for basketball. It's one of the reasons we set on this location. So if, if the game ends on the, the Legends Court. Um, they'll just move up to the parking lot court where there's like three foot candles. It's not the best basketball, but if people wanted to stay, they could stay and they would go over there. So I don't know if they're shining their, I, I don't know, it's just speculation if they're going to shine their headlights on the court. Um, if they are shining their headlights on the court, I'm going to use Carolyn's cursor trick here. Um, how do you get that, Carolyn? Is it? Um, how, uh, no, um, did you right click? Yeah. Sorry, I'll just use the regular cursor. It looks like it's on there. So um, Austin Circle is down here. You can see it on this slide here. So the instance that you're speaking of, I am sorry for that again. I was, I was at the construction site and trying to get some work prepped for the next day. So I was actually parked over here. And the hammering to the water. Sorry the about that. Just jump, just jump yeah, ahead and to I, where we are. I was shining my lights on Austin Circle. It's, it's really not Austin Circle that's going to get steady headlights if the lights are in place. If the lights aren't in place, I, you know, they, they get the headlights when football practice is going on, when basketball is going on. But most people are parked with their cars facing the direction you see here along the court. And so I don't know that it's a direct hit on Austin Circle. So it, it obviously happens. You're saying it happens. So I, I don't know. But I think having the lights here, to your point before, Ms. Taylor, you know, I, I think there's less of that using the headlights to, it's completely subjective, is my opinion, to, to try to light this area than there would be before. A lot of that lighting is coming from the football practices from the uh, farm league games. And now that we have lights in this area, I think people will rely on those and like the overflow that it gives off to sort of be the light source in that area. And so maybe that lights, I, I actually think the headlights cut down 
And then if people want to play basketball after 9, 9.30, they just go up to this area here, which is essentially a parking lot, but there are hoops there. That's where we used to play. So that the option is there. If they want to keep playing, they, they can just kind of, you know, go up the road. And I hope people will abide by that. It's, it's all hopeful, but I think it's certainly something that's plausible. Okay. So the neighbors are... I, I thought they were over here. They're actually so Austin where, Circle is right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so the lights are running parallel to the rectangle, so they'll actually be in this way. And okay. so the cars will park parallel. There is, um, if you go probably maybe another hundred feet. It's hard to say. There's a, another field here, but over in this way is, is Briarwood Street. And Briarwood is actually on a, a, a little bit of an upslope. There's also a tree line there too. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's seasonal. It's it's not the best, but um, there's a little buffer there as well and the elevation is in place as well. And then going the other way, there's uh, Penn Castle Drive over here, but it's on the opposite side of the school. And then up on Ryan Road, it's it's quite a, a ridge going up there. So we're actually in a bit of a bowl here. Okay, Alan. Yeah, I think it's a very admirable and worthwhile <clears throat> project. Um, and I think we should support it. I certainly understand the objections and concerns and complaints of the immediate neighbors. I'd do the same thing if I were living right next to it, but the reality is that they live right next to a major community facility and it's going to be used by the community. Uh, um, and, and the applicant has certainly gone to great lengths to minimize the impact of any lighting on the neighbors. <clears throat> I think to condition the an approval on people who drive there not shining their headlights into the neighbors is not appropriate. It's not part of the application. The, the people coming with cars aren't the applicant. And it, it's no different than saying um, people shouldn't swear or yell when they're, uh, yell when they're playing basketball and condition the permit on that. Uh, I, I, um, I think they've gone to great lengths to consider the neighbors and uh, I'm satisfied with it. Okay. There's no overarching indication that any of these facilities, any of the other, have to get over with at any particular time, I'm assuming. That I don't know what the school department policies are, but um, I, you know, so I can't speak to that. But, okay, but as far as the zoning or anything else, yeah, there's, there's no, no, no limitations. No. So the limitations we put on are for lighting, right. which right. has a secondary impact, but only a secondary impact. I mean, we, do, we do that with business uh, yeah, sure. an hour after yeah. business closed Absolutely. or whatever. So I'd be inclined to go with 9 o'clock as yeah. well. Any other comments? Last, I last shot. I mention that some of the Ryan Road lighting Right by the court there, there is uh, <coughs> one high, very high lighting aimed at the school. It's like right over here, right? Yeah. This guy yeah, in yeah. the corner. Yeah. 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 And that comes on and off when somebody walks by it. Okay. So it That's like actually, to protect the school a little bit. I think bit. that light is broken. Sorry for the sidebar. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but okay. something like that is very passable. Okay. Also, where that pointer is, where he was pointing, where the green grass is. That's where, I mean, because there's three diamonds going and they do, for baseball, there's always cars. I mean, they're back to back in there. It looks like old Blight of Ford. I'm dating myself. Um, but I mean, they leave when it's before dark. Okay. All the activities, except for this little bit of football practice when the parents, but that's shining across the field, not at mm -hmm. us. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Well, yeah. I guess just to throw one more curmudgeonly comment in, um, you know, we have these residential lighting standards for commercial um, and other um, instances. Understanding that this is a different application, the reason we have those standards in place is to protect the residential neighborhoods. I'm not, ex it's not clear to me on what basis we throw that out and say, well, we have no, you know, we have no standard and because we don't have a standard, it's okay. We're happy with this, but there really is no, 
you know, we are setting precedent with this. In, in we this, are setting precedent. In this case, to, to meet the standard, you'd have to have a poll at center court, you know, to shine light. Because at three foot candles, you'd, ha you'd have polls all over the place. And so obviously you can't do that on a court. And so if you have three foot candles around the perimeter, you, you can't play. And so that negates the reality of, of what you need for lighting, whether it's an uh, ice hockey rink or basketball or whatever. So we're in a kind of a funky zone. But I think I would also, just to um, add another point of clarification, um, again, the allowance for exceeding what the sort of baseline standard is, is to consider um, different rationales for different functions and different uses. So I wouldn't classify it as throwing out the standards more than just considering um, the rationale in the application, <coughs> what the applicants tried to do, showing you that what happens when you have lights that are five degrees above angle for versus 90 degree and fewer poles and why you would need for this particular application a basketball court evenly distributed light across the center or the entire court. So I don't, I think that um, the purpose of a hearing is for you to review this. If the applicant had just come and said, well, I want 20 foot candles and that was it um, and 5,000 K, I mean, we don't have a standard yet for color temperature, but um, 5,000 without any rationale, I think that would be a good <laughs> argument to say, right. why, why should we throw everything out? You haven't provided us any information. I, I think it's, so, it's I, I mean, I guess what I would support is something that says, you know, 9 p.m., the motion sensitive light, uh, 20, and 20 feet, and 5,000 5, K. But I mean, motion sensitive and 9 p.m. is mm -hmm. I think a, a good, it's a good compromise. And, and it sounds like that, I mean, it sounds like there was some miscommunication between the organization and, and the, the neighbors. But it also sounds like the organization has in their, in their youth done, a, they've tried to do a good job. And so I think moving forward, I think we can, I'd like to believe that we can trust that everyone will communicate the best and um, I guess use this to make sure that uh, only positive things go on at this facility. Uh, public comment still open. Can I get a motion to close? I move. So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? Okay, so public comment is, is closed. Uh, we will discuss a little further and then make a motion. Uh, any other comments? I've got, so I've got some potential conditions. Uh, you just went through most of them. Uh, I'll go through these and, and, and you can see what we think. First was the color temp. They're willing to come to 4,500. I'm saying if they're willing to, let them, let them do it. Um, it. It proves to be an issue, then they'll come back. Just like if 9 o'clock yeah. proves to be an issue. Yeah. That's not a condition because that's motion sensors. So dim from dawn, from dusk to where am I saying now? Yeah, dusk motion to nine thirty unless, it's unless just somebody comes. Okay. So that was that was uh, an option, but I think that should be a condition. Yep. Okay. Are we good with that? That means the lights would not come on. They'll come down to a, a dim level, two or three foot candles, until a group of guys comes to play or whatever a group comes to play basketball. Then they'll go up to one. Till nine o'clock. Well, well, that's another condition. Yeah. So is that we're good on that? Um, nine versus nine thirty. I mean, I just think that you say nine p.m. and if there is some event that is a great event, like everything, you you go knock on doors and tell people and go ask the right people for it to be extended. But nine p.m. is what what neighbors should be able to expect mm -hmm. you know they shouldn't have like i, I if, as you're saying like, if, if it's if this thing is so well used that it needs to be 9 30 then they can come back and, and ask for that but why 9 p.m is you know i mean 
is fair. I mean, my father would even get sort of mad at that. <laughs> <laughs> How about the notion of summer hours, July and August till 9.30, everything else till 9, or just leave it at 9 to begin leave with? Leave it at 9. Yeah, what is summer? <laughs> right. These days, you're right. <laughs> Uh, screening, the notion of screening on the, I don't know what side of the court that is, but that faces the, uh, the neighborhood. I don't think that's necessary given how the lights fall off anyway by design. Well, it's certainly zero at the, at the lot line, which it has right. to be. Um, but that, I think, was in deference to the neighbors. The, the lights won't be shining at the neighbors through the woods, but there will be light through the woods that could be seen and maybe my only concern with that if you put an eight foot arborvitae but you've got 20, 20 foot poles um, you know so yeah they're going to see it anyway yeah. well, I think that the in my mind the the they're almost different things I, I think that the fence makes sense there but it's not in my mind it doesn't have anything to do with this this plan it has to do with people rudely shine their lights on their car or something like that right but those are sort of separate things it's like you need to go to the whatever board needs to be talked to to say uh you know we need to put up a, a some sort of blockage how about signage to say I think whatever please turn off your headlights yeah, or please, please be aware of please be friendly or well, i don't know what the word is <laughs> uh, yes, why not <laughs> So I don't know how that would be. They have to uh, turn on their headlights to read the sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if we can make that a condition or put it at, you know, just something that. I don't think we should make that a condition, but no. those people may think to do that. That might be something that, <laughs> that the applicant could, could yes. strongly consider. Yeah. Wonderful. They could put it in this. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's all I had for potential conditions. Anybody have anything else? make a move that we approve subject to those conditions so the conditions are uh, motion sensors nine o'clock and that's it right 45 4500 45. 45. 45 well that wasn't a con that was they what there were the that was the application okay yeah. well it's not in the application they suggested in the hearing so I think okay they so absolutely that. yes yeah. okay and if they need to change it then like so 4500 motion sensors and nine o'clock and we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstain? One abstention. And we have the numbers, yes. We need four. So four to one. It's approved. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, second hearing. We're a little behind schedule. Down that way, maybe. <laughs> schedule for 715, uh, site plan for a detached uh, principal structure for Patrick and Cheryl Malone at 117 Lake Street, Florence, MAP ID 17A 226. Do we have a presentation? Yes, I have. Uh, my name is Michael Powell. I'm a uh, construction supervisor, and I'm working with Cheryl and Patrick on uh, planning their retirement home that they'd like to build on their property at 117 Lake Street. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, I'll read the, a brief description of what we're asking for. Uh, we propose the addition of a third detached unit structure. Um, the project will protect the adjoining neighbors through use of preservation of the old growth trees that exist on the property. Um, it were, uh, is designed to provide a uh, significant setback as well as uh, we will be planning shrubs and growth to act as a buffer for privacy and from headlights of cars. Uh, the plan provides additional parking for the two family, which currently does not exist, and as such will reduce on street parking and traffic. The design of the house incorporates, uh, as we've made an attempt to make it look nice, uh, so uh, and it incorporates classic architectural features uh, fitting to the neighborhood uh, uh, with, an, uh, with the idea of not overwhelming the adjoining spaces or the, um, the block face, the two family in the front. The proposed third unit construction represents the owner's effort to make use of their existing space and an efficient footprint. Um, the structure has been designed not just as a garage to house a motorhome, there's a large motorhome that 
we, the, the owner, the applicant would like to park, uh, mm -hmm. but as an attractive addition to the subject site that allows uh, Patrick and Cheryl to live comfortably into their retirement in an owner-occupied multifamily setting. Uh, they chose to share the space, <coughs> develop this tract of the land. Uh, sh uh, they like to share water and utilities to the extent permissible and create an efficient, practical off-street parking for their tenant vehicles and their large motorhome. Um, it, so there's been some effort to fit it in the block face. Uh, the, um, we've uh, paid attention to uh, creating an attractive structure in harmony with the compl and complementary to the neighborhood, uh, minimizing on-street parking uh, by creating a garage space and a large tenant parking in the back of the two-family. Um, uh, one of the things they would like is to keep the second curb cut. There's two curb cuts. Um, and uh, this kind of relates to the, the first presentation. Uh, one of the uses is there's a basketball hoop in that second driveway, and uh, we could see that it could be used by tenant children to play basketball in this particular driveway. So that's kind of funny that that came up. But that's one of the uses for the existing. Send them uh, to Ryan Road now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess. So, but for those little kids that get pushed out of Ryan Road. But um, the existence of, so it also uh, could be uh, used as a, as a closer uh, handicapped parking space, uh, potentially. And uh, another thought could be that this is uh, s close to the structure of the two family of this particular driveway could be useful for future electric vehicle charging and uh, uh, bicycle parking. So they're requesting to keep the second curb cut. Um, and. Uh, addressing the concern that uh, was been raised about the mass and scale of the proposed structure, um, the current plan uh, ha we set, I s we work to set it back quite a ways. So it's 128 feet from the street. Uh, it's in, in sort of the rear of the lot, and uh, it's behind these two sizable maples that we would like to preserve. Uh, and uh, due to the setback from the street, it. Uh, it creates a, a discrete, um, not that visible uh, from the street uh, situation. Um, so that's that would be my defense for the concern of the uh, increased mass and scale uh, in relationship to the existing two family on this on the site. Uh, now, the current plan is set back and discreetly designed to keep the oversized mass needed to provide the RV. Uh, garage so the oversized mass is really a required condition for the parking of this motor home um, and providing uh, the living space uh, needed um, while there is more mass it is designed to flow with the lot and we've made an effort to fit it into the block face um, the proposed structure is seven feet wider uh, than the two family in the front um, However, due to the fact that it's set back that 128 feet from the street, you can't, you will not, you will not be visible from directly in front of the two family. If you stand to the side, you of course will be able to see it. But again, um, it it helps the, that it's back. Um, some other points I can make um, would be that. Um, uh, the trees will be protected. We would like to protect them, so uh, step, steps will be taken to ensure that they are protected during construction. Um, so our plan gets the RV out of the driveway, protected in garage, and provides substantial off-street parking. Um, and um, I, now I would like to you know, give it over to you guys for uh, many people. Okay. Uh, Carolyn, for members on the board and the public, uh, especially could you just touch on the, the, the zoning, the minimum for sure. three units and so forth? So this is an urban residential B and um, for, um, um, it, it allows a three family, meaning within one structure or um, if um, there's a detached residential structure proposed that requires a site plan review by the planning board. Um, the number of units allowed per parcel potentially um, is one unit per 2,500 square feet of lot size. The reason why I say it potentially is it also depends <coughs> on the other um, requirements for open space and um, as the applicant read, um, 
scale and massing, setbacks, mm -hmm. landscaping, things of that sort. So um, uh, this is a lot, definitely a larger lot size and it's a deeper lot. So um, a third, again, a third unit detached from uh, another principal structure on the property is what's triggering planning board. Also, there are two curb cuts, and although those are existing, there's a changing condition here, so that sort of opens up that evaluation. Is that still a safe situation? Um, or should that second curb cut that um, wouldn't be allowed today as a new curb cut um, still, uh, does that need to be consolidated with the, into one? So, Karen, <coughs> do do they have to show compliance with special permit criteria or no? No, it's site plan criteria in which they must that they must comply with, but it's also the zoning table specifically for. Um, so there's a, there are four elements of design in the urban residential B table. So whether or not they were they triggered site plan or were by right. Those. Sure. So these will be the criteria that they have to satisfy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the lot size is big enough. Right. So but there's other criteria to meet as right. well. Right. So the minimum lot size is one unit per 2,500 square feet. So for a three unit, you'd need 7,500 square feet of lot size. Mm -hmm. and I think this is close to half an acre. Um, and then there are setbacks, 15 feet on the, each side, 10 feet on the front and 20 feet to the rear. Um, and then in terms of design standards, um, uh, the planning board may waive by site plan approval elements two, three, and four if it can be shown that a different design meets the pedestrian scale design that encourages public-private transition interface, e.g. similar elements facing internal courtyards and private streets. Um, the first design element, however, is not waivable by the planning board, and it speaks to having a garage, attached garage um, to um, attach to the principal structure that's on the street. So I don't think that one applies because this is a street-facing um, unit, mm -hmm. which is already there. Um, design criteria two, front doors may space the street for units extending behind front units where entries orient to the side lot, the 20 foot side setback shall apply unless other means to create a buffer or private outdoor space to the adjoining property are approved by the board. Um, buildings must have a covered um, front entry. Number three, for new buildings, setback scale massing should fit within the block base. Within the block base? What is that? So um, that standard it typically is sort of if you're building along the street front and you have a vacant <coughs> parcel or you have a, um, a gap, that your scale setback and massing should be consistent with what the other structures are along that block on that side of the street as opposed to <coughs> necessarily. Uh, so how does that apply here? Um, so block face, it doesn't. I think there's also within the site plan standards, there's also um, fitting in the context to the neighborhood scale and massing within the general site plan standards. So there's no language like in the special permit criteria about being in harmony with the adjo adjoining or adjacent buildings or neighborhood? Um, there are um, similar criteria to special permit. Um, um, and I'll just pull this out. Um, so the approval criteria under 11.6, um, um, it's about traffic, it's about um, utility infrastructure. Um, C is the site will function harmoniously in relation to other structures and open spaces and existing buildings in the area as it relates to landscape as well as it relates to landscaping, drainage, site lines, building orientation, massing, and setbacks. So we would have to find that that is satisfied. Mm -hmm. I think in this case it 
the discussion might fall on the massing of the building. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Could you read that again, please? Sure. One section. So this is 11.6C for site plan approval criteria. The site will function harmoniously in relation to other structures and open spaces to the natural um, landscape, existing buildings. Sorry, my screen is. So the site will function harmoniously in relation to other structures and open spaces to the natural landscape, existing buildings, and other community assets in the area as it relates to landscaping, drainage, sight lines, building orientation, massing, egress, and setbacks, rear and or side walls, wall facades. <coughs> um, that section doesn't apply. To, that's related to cycle tracks. So that's it. So this is a, this is a two-story building proposed and a two-story building in front. There are one-story buildings on the side, but there are two-story buildings in, in other places. So the height is not the issue. I wouldn't say so. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then when there's a, it meets the ma max, the maximum height. Right, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, so it, it fits in, in a mixed, it's a mixed neighborhood mm -hmm. and it fits. So then the question of scale is a question of the fact that the footprint is right. quite large compared to the the house in front of it. I mean, that's and the houses really around it. And the houses around it, right. yes. Mm. But it's also considerably back. Right. Right. I, I think the other piece too is the location of the large. And is there is the curb cut? Is there reason to not allow to change to not? get rid of one of the curb cuts? Usually, every time we have an opportunity to get rid of a curb cut, we do that, because okay. it's safer. Got it. it means less people backing out of the yeah, spot yeah, and less, yeah. right. Yeah. But they're asking to keep it. Should right. We I'd be interested in hearing what the neighbors. Yep, I just, are we all set for, okay. Uh, we're gonna open up to public comment, so again, if for those who are here earlier, if you could raise your hand and come to the podium, uh, I'll call on you. Ma'am, you were quick to the gun, so come on up. Um, and just uh, introduce your name, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, I'm Gretchen Worley. I live at 121 Lake Street. Can we be up here together? Sure. Uh, Peter Bade, I live in uh, 121 Lake Street with Gretchen. <coughs> Okay, um, so I need to give a little bit of um, background. Um, I um, am not a native to um, uh, Florence or Northampton. I grew up in Rhode Island, <clears throat> and I moved um, to Western Mass um, after finishing college, and um, I was looking for a community that I wanted to settle in, and a friend of mine said, <clears throat> you should look at Florence, um, and I drove by those, um, you know, the Smith Folk Fields, and I, you know, fell in love with that view. Drove into the town <clears throat> and looked around and looked at the backyards. I mean, that's, Florence is a town of backyards, beautiful backyards. Um, and um, I've lived here for 25 years. Um, <clears throat> this is the second home I've owned in Florence. Um, I've lived at uh, 121 Lake Street for four years, um, <clears throat> and the yard there is one of the things that really um, sold me on the house. Um, <clears throat> there was a woman, a family that lived in the house um, for, I don't know, 40 years um, before I bought it, and um, <clears throat> Chio, the woman, Japanese woman who lived there, um, spent hours and hours and hours in her yard, beautifying her yard. It's a beautiful black, a backyard. Um, you refer to it as a lot. Um, I think it's important for you to um, understand that these are yards. Um, and 
Um, so during the four years that I've lived there, I've continued to work on my backyard. Um, I have had good relationships with the tenants, um, you know, that live next door at, at 117 Lake Street, the yard that you are in the process of discussing. Um, that yard uh, next door has been used by tenants. Um, they have children, um, animals. Uh, people use the backyard for um, <clears throat> recreation, you know, volleyball net, um, badminton net, um, grilling. You know, they have yard uh, chairs out in the yard. The two trees that are being discussed um, are, you know, beautiful old trees. They provide shade for the whole, um, all, all the backyards in, in our area. I can tell you that if, um, when I look, went and looked at my house, um, if there was a 4,000 foot, uh, square foot structure in that backyard next to mine, I would not have bought my house. The concerns that I have about the proposed um, project um, is that this structure is 32 feet tall. So you asked about, is there a problem with the height? Yes, um, there is a problem with the height. Um, a 32 foot tall structure would block both daytime light and airflow from my home and my property. The second floor, which would be taller than a typical second floor because the first floor is big enough to accommodate this huge RV. Okay, so that needs to be taken to, into account when you think about what this structure is going to look like. Um, so the second floor would, of this st proposed structure would overlook my backyard, which is a sanctuary for me, uh, my friends, my family. Um, it's a private and a, a peaceful space that has been cultivated for many, many years by not only me. <clears throat> that would be disrupted by this <coughs> looming structure, which would be placed, yes, far back on the lot, but it would loom over my yard and my home. Um, the additional paved area for multiple parking spots and the RV turnaround we're talking about quite a bit of pavement on that plan. Um, this would increase runoff into Lake Street. Um, the existing storm drain um, that is on Lake Street going up toward um, Bridge Road, there's a little dip there. Um, that existing storm drain <clears throat> is already overloaded in heavy rain. <clears throat> it backs up. Every time we have heavy rain, it backs up. It's something that the DPW is constantly Kind of trying to mitigate, um, but it is, it is not in any way um, fixed. When we have heavy rain, the water um, from that storm drain backs up into my driveway and has flooded my basement. Under current conditions, we're talking about adding a lot of additional pavement, would, which would result in some a lot of additional runoff into the street. <clears throat> Additionally, um, the master bedroom in my home is in the back corner um, on the first floor, which overlooks the site, that it, the building site. Um, so noise, light, and exhaust fumes from vehicles um, would come in through my wi the windows of my bedroom and disrupt my sleep and the enjoyment of my home. Additionally, the two large shade trees that were um, discussed, the maples um, <clears throat> in the backyard, um, they, as I said, they provide shade and cooling for the backyards, all of the backyards. My boundary line is right up against the uh, maple tree that's um, on the boundary between 121 and 117. <clears throat> the boundary line is right up against that tree. Um, the Proposed parking spaces and paved turnaround would be over the over the tree roots. Um, additionally, the 2,000 plus square foot foundation also is in the vicinity of the tree roots. I don't see how you can dig a 2,000 square foot um, uh, uh, foundation hole in a backyard and 
<clears throat> and not disrupt the, um, the roots. Also, um, I know that there's a plan to trim back the trees for the proposed project. These multiple stressors could, in all likelihood, result in the tree, one or both of the trees, demise. This would take out the only natural barrier between my home and the proposed structure. Uh, this would exacerbate the problems I previously mentioned, light and noise problems. My understanding is that a, a zoning variance is a deviation from the set of rules a municipality applies to land use and development. <clears throat> and my understanding is that variances are, are um, given um, if there's a hardship on the part of the owner. You know, uh, so if they had an odd shaped lot, so that was preventing them from having the same benefit <clears throat> that their neighbors might have in terms of expanding on their property. I don't see that this is a hardship um, situation. Um, so I want to say that. <clears throat> I also want to say that, you know, I moved to this town because of, of the, what it is, what Florence is. It's a, it's a nice village um, in the deep backyards are part of what make it what it is. Um, I think we need to, to preserve that character. Um, I don't think we want Florence to become a village of, of structures which are shoehorned, where they don't fit with the character of the neighborhoods. <clears throat> and I would argue that this structure that's proposed does not in any way fit with the character of the neighborhood. There's no, there's no building in our neighborhood or anywhere near that is 4,000 square feet. Um, <clears throat> finally, approving these types of pro projects pits neighbor against neighbor, okay? Because I have to stand up here. Um, well, I don't have to. I, I'm choosing to stand up here because this is, you know, you, this is, re we're talking about my quality of life um, at my home. <clears throat> um, but it pits neighbor against neighbor and does not promote a positive um, community atmosphere. And I've heard this from other people <clears throat> about these, these projects that are being um, approved by this board. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we need to respect everybody's rights. And I feel like this project really, um, you know, violates the rights of the, the abutting neighbors and more of the neighbors are here um, and who feel as strongly about this as I do. So on these grounds, and, and many others, I ask that this variance be denied. Um, I just, just for what Gretchen had said, um, I had sent some pictures to, to, to Carolyn. And just, uh, I, I wish I had them here because it would kind of show you just the, the way the neighborhood is there. Um, it's beautiful. So this structure in the back, just, it just doesn't fit. I mean, you have this, you know, it's, it's whatever, 30, 30 feet, 7,700 square feet of pavement. You could put a basketball court there. I mean, who knows? Where's the lighting? I, I, you know, you look at this plan. I don't know where the lights are. Where, you know, how, is that going to shine on us? I don't have detail. That's another, you know, where's the, 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 the perimeter of the pavement? There's a lot of unknowns here. Um, but if you, if you look at that compared to the rest of the neighborhood on that street, it just does not fit. It does not fit. So, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is Dave Carpenter. I live at 191 Bridge Road. Um, it's not Lake Street, but it's kind of towards the back there. Um, I'll keep it kind of short. Basically, to put a building that big in that backyard will um, it's just kind of an eyesore. It won't really fit with the rest of the buildings. And it's much larger than anything that's in those neighborhoods. I mean, the typical houses are about 1,000 square feet. Most of them are single level houses. And I just, uh, it would really, all those houses are flowing uh, backyards. And having that large of a structure there will really just kind of uh, ruin everyone's backyard. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. 
Jonathan Labrie, um, 35 Valley Road in Southampton. I'm here to represent the, the Benoit family who lives at 111 Lake Street. Um, they are my in-laws. Um, elderly, Jim Benoit grew up at 105 Lake Street. It was the very next lot, two lots down from the proposed uh, site. That's where he grew up as a kid. He's been there, he's, he's 70 years old now. The applicant mentioned retirement home. This is Jim's retirement home and Kathy's retirement home. This proposal, this building is going to ruin his retirement home. They just retired recently. Kathy's a cancer survivor. She went through a lot over the last few years. Jim suffered a stroke not long ago recovered. This is the last thing they need. From their line in their backyard, this building would start 17 and a half feet off of their backyard line, the side lot. It would go up 32 feet. That's a long ways up. Their lot is 82 feet wide, both of the lots, approximately 82 feet wide. How do they get privacy? The applicant mentioned, I'm not here to attack the applicant. I'm here to defend uh, Jim and Kathy. With such a structure, the second floor, the living quarters of this floor is so high because of the the raised level to accommodate the motorhome, even without <clears throat> that extra level, is so high, shrubbery, fences, nothing we can put up or they can put up is going to protect Jim and Kathy's privacy. When you're standing 14 feet up looking out your second floor window, um, probably up 18, 20 feet, how do you protect their privacy? You can't see it from the road, they said, or you, in, front of the, uh, in, front of the, in front of the existing two family. You can't see it from the road. I understand that, I agree. Jim and Kathy's house is roughly 1,100 square feet with a deck on the back. You can see it from their deck. You can see it from their house. You can, you'll be able to see this structure from the front of their house looking over their roof. It's going to be that high. Good. We're looking at a 1,200 square foot, I mean 1,100 square foot ranch. So pulling up to their yard, you'll see this building coming through the top of their house. It's a bad idea for the neighborhood. I've known them for 32 years, I love them dearly, and I, it breaks my heart to see what's going to happen to them. It's a terrible idea. I suggest that the board does not pass this tonight. Schedule a site visit. Let's go for a bus ride. Let's meet up there. Let's walk through the neighborhoods. I'm sure all the neighbors would be glad to let you walk through their backyards, see how beautiful they are, what the street looks like. Has, has anybody been down Lake Street to look at this at all? Let's go for a ride. Meet the neighbors. Get their point of view from their point of view, not from this room. I got for now. Okay. Thank you. I really wish you guys would consider not doing this. And if it does happen, there's got to be some conditions, of course. Um, where is the drainage going to go? That's the last thing Jim and Kathy need is a basement full of water. 
they don't need lights shining into their yard. But again, with a 32 foot structure with lights on it, it doesn't take far to sh doesn't take much to shine 82 feet across their lot into the two neighbors down lot. There's got to be something for noise. I think there's got to be structure there for kids. So they, people stay in, the, if that's the case, I don't know if there's kids there or not, but they don't want people running through their backyard either because it's, it's, not, it's not what they're there for. They're there to retire. He has a garden in the back. He likes to take care of his yard and just be left alone. And this is, it's, a, it's not the way they should be retiring. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep, right in the back. I'm Rich Benoit. I live at 105 Lake Street. And uh, <coughs> I don't have any uh, paperwork with me, but you guys all have pictures of the lot. And you can see down the whole street on Lake Street and Maple Street that is on the other side. There are no lots with two houses in there. Everybody's just got a single house with a big yard. And I think that's probably the draw um, on why everybody moves to that area. Uh, Oak Street, Lake Street, and Maple Street are all pretty much laid out the same. They all have big yards and uh, just a single house. Um, Looking at the, I looked at online and saw the plans for this house, and it's like twice the size of the two-family house that's there already. And when you're reading the uh, the outlines of the criteria about uh, being, <clears throat> I don't remember exactly <coughs> what it said. It's it's not going to fit in that neighborhood. Um, and with that house being as high as it is, uh, like John was just saying, is they're going to Anybody sitting outside is going to be looking at this huge house that doesn't fit in the backyard of any of the neighborhoods there. So, um, what was the proposed uh, parking area there? How, how the turnaround big, area for was the it? RV? Yeah. It was a turnaround area that's 16 feet deep by 18 feet, and then there's an additional 40 foot uh, space for four parking spaces. So you're going to have a huge house, a huge parking lot, and a backyard of a quiet neighborhood. I just I don't see how that makes any sense. So I would hope that uh, you guys use good judgment and uh, not grant this variance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing I, sh I should point out: this isn't this isn't a variance. This is the the this is a site plan review. They're not looking, um, this isn't a variance request on zoning. So special permit allows this board to have, for lack of a better word, like esoteric big picture conversations. Does this belong? Does it not belong? So forth. Site plan review is, we're very restricted on our parameters. We talk about setbacks and the, the current zoning conditions, but we do talk about height and we do talk about massing and things of that nature, but it's on a, on a, on a smaller, more restrictive scale. So we're limited to a certain extent what we can review um, mm. and some of the arguments that are being made, although all valid, are frankly not in our, in our purview. We can't, we, our, our lens is narrower than that. Um, but just to so everybody understands where we're coming from. Anybody else in the public uh, with comment or a question? Could I rebut some of the? Uh, yeah, after everybody's. Uh, anybody who hasn't commented yet? No? OK. Yep. I, I, understand, I understand the purpose of, of what you're doing here. And I know that I understand there's nothing we can do to stop it if they meet all the parameters of the zoning requirements. I, I understand that. I know us saying denying it tonight isn't going to change anything because it might mean, if you need, even if you did deny it, a few tweaks here and there, and it goes back to you guys, and you can't stop, you can't not pass this. Agreed? If they meet all the requirements, correct. Exactly, right. So the only thing we can do tonight pretty much is 
add conditions. Is that correct? Not if they meet all the requirements. That, well, no, like well, say we're like you know. What's that? I think the board needs to discuss. Yeah. Making yeah. Determination. Yeah. It, it, it could actually, you could deny. Yeah, absolutely. We can continue it. We could deny it. We could approve it with mm -hmm. conditions. So yeah. there's a there's a bunch of different things we can do, and we're still in the middle of it. So. All right. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. One last shot. I just wanted to say that um, now what you what you were asking about. I'm sorry, so I can't see your name, Mr. Person. Person. Um, you were asking Carolyn about um, the uh, the eleven point six the criteria. So now, doesn't that fall under your yes. pur purview? Yes. And isn't that a big question of what of what's being determined here? As far as the site <coughs> plan goes, um, you know, the, 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 the pavement, you know, the, the 7,700 square feet, so that's a structure plus the, 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 the pavement. Now, what percentage of that is the, the, the drainage it bothers me a lot because the drain there does fill up considerably. So the rate is an issue. So. How does that affect the current uh, drain? Has this input? been reviewed by DPW as far as drainage and so forth that they have? That is. Um, so the plans did go to the Department of Public Works. Um, it doesn't require a separate stormwater permit. It doesn't rise to that threshold. Um, the requirements are that you know drainage has to be maintained on site. They can't shed drainage off to the sides. Um, DPW didn't have any comments about drainage. They have a lot of comments about trees and water and sewer connections. Um, okay. Protecting the trees, they, um, they had a lot of comments about the layout of the pavement and the structure related to that tree protection. Okay. But not so much. Yep. Okay. Um, and then detailing the plan as far as um, the perimeter of the pavement, I don't, don't see that here. Okay. Um, the aerial view shows you exactly what. Yep. The Thank you. Uh, Michael, did you want to say a few things? Uh, designed the roof line uh, to come down over the uh, larger um, garage for the parking, for the parking of the RV. So uh, to minimize the, uh, the height that would be needed for the actual structure, uh, I added a, a, an attractive porch feature over the uh, RV garage as, a, uh, as a, a, a design element to beautify it um, uh, in, in respect and thoughtfulness for um, the architectural quality of the of the structure um, and uh, being appealing to the eye um, also um, uh, this is on a slab so there will be less uh, invasive digging uh, than a full basement in terms of disruption for the roots of, of the two trees I uh, address the, the I, I want to preserve these trees so I love trees uh, Old growth, especially, and I have a lot of respect for that. And I think we set it back far enough from the tree uh, root system. But if it turns out that it needs to go a little more, we'd be willing to do that. I think, uh, and, and to preserve the trees. Um, and it, so the house itself hasn't been raised uh, in any uh, extra way to accommodate. much less attractive than what we've set out to do here and, and create something that is pleasing to the eye um, and, and has some architectural features that are um, in, in harmony with the neighborhood. So I'm, I'm, I'm with that all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Questions by the board? So the 31 feet thing, uh, is that? Peak. Peak, the peak of the house. 
so it's uh, is that standard? Is that that's stand? A it's a, seems fairly high. It's to the peak. The minimum yeah. height is thirty-five feet, and that would be to the midpoint of a peak. So this is the peak is at thirty-one. So, um, but I think you know, and there are other houses on the street that are two and a half story, you know, okay. with peak roofs. Um, but I think that it's probably the combination of trying to accommodate such a large motor vehicle that isn't very typical. Yeah. It expands well, that. Right. You Got know, it. Out. So I also want to reiterate that a third unit detached by itself is allowed. Um, but again, you need to review this. So if you feel that there are issues that need to be addressed, um, I think it's important to um, identify that it's not the third unit per se, but it's how right. it's yeah. designed and laid out. Alan? So. Well, even given the narrow confine of our review in terms of the ordinance, I have a hard time concluding that this satisfies the requirement of being compatible forget the exact wording being compatible with the adjacent structures in terms of massing and orientation it would um, it would have a very substantially negative impact on the immediate neighborhood I wouldn't have any trouble approving a smaller house but 4,500 feet just is it's not compatible um, and I would like to see the applicant come back with a design for a considerably smaller one I, I would other? feel compelled to vote against it mm -hmm. I, I would second that I, think that is, yeah, I, that I agree as well right I'm struggling that the wording is uh, function harmoniously in relation to existing buildings among other things and I think the building as a standalone structure is nice they did a good job with what they're trying to do but in this context it it doesn't fit the massing um, the massing's just off it's twice two and a half times housing that second house inside the first house which is sort of what you're doing with with the uh, the travel with van RV. is it just complicates right. things rather I mean this in a sense this is allowed this is what we're the recent changes are trying to promote is instead of people going off and extending services out of town or down the road in the boonies being downtown where things are walkable take advantage of a large lot size and build something that's in harmony with everything around it um, and so this to me is it's the right idea but the wrong result um, Anyway, uh, so we still have uh, public comment open. Is, is all the paving, is all the parking, et cetera, paving, as opposed to some of it being gravel and therefore permeable? Uh, gravel parking is not considered permeable. Yeah. So we still consider it uh, okay. impervious because of compaction. There's, a, there's like a 2%. It's not much different yet. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I don't know if you want me to read DPW comments. Yeah. At this point. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, their um, water and sewer, sewer services are not shown. Um, the water service shall be connected to the main dwelling unit, water meter, sewer service um, is independent of the main house sewer. It should have a clean out of the property line. Um, the two large maples appear to be significant trees. The applicant shall abide by the requirements of significant tree ordinance. Um, the, the proposed construction footprint and location appears that there will be significant construction impacts to these trees. Protection of the trees in accordance with ANSI 300 Part 5 standards should be provided and the applicant shall confer with the tree warden to establish how tree and root protection will be achieved where construction activities may encroach on the protection zone. A second existing curb cut is non-conforming and removal of it is, as a condition of the permit should be considered despite the supporting claims from the applicant. If the curb, is required, curb cut is required to be abandoned, the asphalt and bituminous uh, return shall be removed and bituminous curb shall be installed 
across the open with a reclaimed area to be loaned and seeded. So the okay. tree, the tree uh, warden hasn't, no one has seen this and really looked to see whether or not the slab and other things are going to be a problem as far as these trees are concerned. Well, I don't know if the slab per se, it's out, and I believe, my guess is based on this language, the tree warden did look at it, um, or looked at the plans briefly. He's more concerned about construction. Well, I know that. that. But there is As the opposed to of excavation the, per se. But there is the question, of, I mean, those are, it's a very large tree. There are two of them. Yeah, right. well, I, the one in particular seems to be relatively close to where they're, so I just wondered whether or not there'd been a, a specifics about that. Yeah. I can't um, tell you for certain okay. that the tree warden looked at the plans, but my guess is based on these comments that he did. Okay. So public comment's still open. We can continue. Move to close public. Well, we can just to go through the options, right? We can, if we leave the public comment open, we can continue the hearing. Right. and let the applicant <coughs> give it another shot based on the comments of the board on our struggles with the massing. Um, we can close it and vote one way or the other. Can, we can't continue after we close, can we? No, then you, you, could you could vote and close and then they'd have to reapply. Right, so they'd have to start over, which so might be. So we should just leave it open? It, 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 it's, yeah, I don't know. You'd have to continue it to a date certain. So you'd either if you were going to entertain that idea, you probably want to select something, you know, at least a month, if not more, out. Um, well, if you just close it, and just go and start again. You can reapply when they're ready to reapply. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, is the open public here? It's still open. Yep. Uh, we do have another plan, a plan B that's a smaller size. So, do we? Do we? It sounds like a plan. So, um, yes. So I have to come up? Yep. Sorry. Okay, so if, if this was rescheduled, would, we, would, would the neighbors be re notified? Yes. No. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't. No. This is oh we, we t we'd say tonight. Sorry. This Your notification would be tonight. Time right now. Yeah. We'd tell you tonight, a month from tonight at 7 30 or whatever the time so would be. Not be notified. We don't resend notification of future announcements. Which you can go around and knock. Mm -hmm. yes. But there, it, it'll, you know, we post the agenda on the web page, and um, so, but this is the considered the notification. If we closed it. No, if we continued it and I picked know. a date. Oh, if we closed, closed it, it, then we'd go through the whole thing again. Re notification. Mm -hmm. I would, would, I would ask for that. I think this is a big enough issue in our, for our neighborhood that people should be f informed and that it shouldn't be on, on me or people who are here to have to do that. On the other hand, they didn't show up tonight. But, maybe, but there were reasons why people, there were people that wanted to come. People, the people are very interested in this. I spoke to many, many neighbors. People are concerned. What's it, it's another filing fee? I mean, what, what's at stake? Yeah. yeah, so you close, and then we, actually you could only entertain a, an application that was substantially different than the one that was denied. We could do that. And so the, the applicant reapplies, and then that triggers the process again, so then we send out notice and re-advertise in the Gazette. Yep. What's the application fee? Um, 350. Yes. Sorry, so does that? Pat Malone, 117. Does that mean then if we close, I have to go through the whole, pay another fee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would rather have it continued mm -hmm. so I don't pay that fee. Right. Understood. Thank you.
Well, so I mean, so um, there's two. It's a, it, it is a different plan. Um, uh, same project, different same plan. Same project, different plan. Should they be showing lighting on the application? We don't have any information about Unless that. Unless there's um, a waiver, or you would assume there's no site lighting proposed, it's just exterior house lighting. Normal. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just your normal house lighting, apparently. I mean, I, I think that you made a good point. They didn't show up today. And, you know, asking th for an additional $350. Um, is and so not okay. Motion. So I second the motion to keep, thank you. So we have a motion to continue <laughs> in a second. <laughs> so, so you need to um, move to continue. To a time, time, right. Uh, a month from now. Well, um, I don't think you want to meet. That's up. Thanksgiving. That's Thanksgiving night. I don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. <laughs> so I would say the the that then that would be first. December 11th. Is that I'm sorry, I'm sorry, December 14th. Well, let me ask a question because we are, I, I, I would like to, I'm going to make this motion to extend, but I also want to make it as easy for the neighbors to, to come. Is December, is December 11th. 14th, 11th a good, a good time? Good yeah, it's between, okay. yeah. Between, it's between. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, right. not, it's not Thanksgiving, which is not a good Got thing. it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So we have a motion to continue to the 11th at. I'm sorry, it's December 14th. Oh, sorry, you're right. Motion, 14th. To, <laughs> motion to continue to December 14th. At 7? At, at, at 7. So that's the formal motion. Alan, you want a second? Second. Any discussion? I think, I think none of us are comfortable with what we saw tonight, but but a project back there is allowed, so I think this is a valid thing. Yeah. So it's clear that that it's clear that there can be a project back there, and people need to recognize that. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Thank you. All right, it's continued. That, that's it. We're, we're, so we've continued to the 11th, December 11th at December 7 o'clock. I'm sorry, 14. December 14th at 7 o'clock. Will, will the neighbors be notified of the change? No. No, this is that notification. So the first time we'll see this new design will be. Yeah, we oh, no. We require it to be. Um, we require digital copies that go on the webpage. Okay. A couple weeks prior to the, to the hearing, you'll see it on the website. Thank yep. You. Thank you. Uh, we have two orders of business. One is to approve the minutes of October 12th. I vote to approve the minutes of October 12th. Second. Second by Dan. Any discussion? All in favor? Anyone? By the way, just FYI, I recused myself that time. I mean, I, I wasn't absent. <laughs> right. if you didn't either walk out. If you're not there, you're not no. participating in the meeting. Yeah. Anyway, I, ways, yeah. I, I was representing her, so yeah. recused myself. Okay. And we've got an A and R, or no? We have three. Three? One. It says one. What? Oh, no, it says plural. <laughs> I had to tell you it's all Wayne's idea. <laughs> oh, the big boss did it again. Uh, <laughs> Everyone, we're still we're still meeting, so if you could <coughs> take it outside, <laughs> thank so you. We'll get a whole new application. Yes. Yeah. New materials. Yeah. Um, so this one is on uh, Texas Road. That on what road? 
Texas Road. I thought what you said. It's a funky street. Where is that? It parallels the bike path behind the horse barn. Oh, yeah. As you're coming to the intersection towards East Hampton. So it's a quadrant sorority. They're selling their off their parcels. So they're just creating. It's, it's an industrial zone. So there's no minimum lot size. And they have, it's just a long strip along Texas Road. Okay. Let Texas have it. Yeah. So that was a motion? Motion yes, by Ann. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so the next one is um, Baker Hill Road. Um, okay, I don't know where that is. Either. It's off of Nonatuck Street going heading Goes towards um, Up the hill. Um, do I have this right oriented correctly? Yep. I don't know. Um, so it's this tiny, what is it, four feet? Four, two and a half to yeah. four foot sliver right here. These are two brand new houses that were built. Um, this house didn't know where the pins were, and they built too close to the property. Uh. <laughs> So what? that's what they say. Line. Uh, so this is a land swap so that it will conform to zoning again. Okay. Um, so it's to correct um, a problem with the building. It's cheaper than moving the house. Yeah. Well, it yeah, how was that even discovered? It, because it came up in closing um, and, they're and, and the final certificate of occupancy. No, actually, that's not true. It came up when house number two they were checking their pins before they started the foundation, and they discovered that oh. the house that had just been built uphill <laughs> had built in the wrong location. But it's better than the sawzall approach of just yeah. getting off two feet of the house. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see that approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I need a motion on that one. <laughs> I motion by Alan. Second by Ann. All in favor? Okay. Last one. Um, and then the third one is down at the end of Ladd Avenue. This is part of the Yankee Hill uh, machine shop is closed and they're selling off their parcels. So they sit the cutlery is over here, um, Riverside Drive. So they're creating um, on this side, really, this is just sort of a map, uh, a perimeter plan basically for an existing lot. They're not changing any boundaries on this side, although they own that property. They're proposing to divide this into three lots. There, there's enough frontage for that. There's one concern I have, but I'm, I would write as an, part of the endorsement, write on the plan that no determination about the buildability of this parcel has been made because it's in the riverfront for the most part. Mm -hmm. And because of the Rivers Act, there may be some restrictions on what can happen there. Mm -hmm. But from a zoning perspective, or from a, sorry, for a subdivision perspective or a &R perspective, they have the frontage and that's all the planning board can consider. Thank you. you get a motion? Aye. Motion to Motion second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Alan, you in with us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Before we We're out. Can, oh. I, can I just raise one thing, not um, not to prolong the meeting, but it's a coincidence that we got into this issue tonight because I wanted to discuss pretty much this very issue for the future. Now, with um, I about six months ago, maybe or is six months or eight ten months, we approved a two-family development on Route Nine. Yep. Um, that I drive by, I voted for it. <clears throat> I drive by it twice every single day and regret having voted for it um, because it involves. Uh, it, it, uh, part of the reason I'm mentioning this is that I invite everybody to drive by and take a look at it. It's it's about a couple hundred yards before the roundabout on the right hand side going yeah. west, mm -hmm. yeah. and I it. Too yeah, to me it looks like we approved an elephant I in the middle of a little of a bunch of bunnies it is so oversized and inappropriate for that location i really regret having voted for it and i think it's a, it's the perfect
place where we should have said it doesn't satisfy the special permit criteria right. because it's not harmonious with adjacent structures. And I don't know why, in hindsight, it didn't come up, um, but it should have. And I think we should be vigilant about that yeah. in the future. As I say, it's coincidence that we got into pretty much the same issue. Right. I, I feel the same way about Hinkley. You know, yeah. Yes. Hinkley yes. Is, looks, looks good, except for what's right on the road looks like hell. Right. And I wouldn't be surprised if that unit never sells mm -hmm. because it's so ugly. Mm -hmm. And I, I would find it really difficult to approve anything that comes back with this because I will always be able to say that it doesn't work with the massing. Well, um, Where it's, we, you yeah. continue to say So we can't discuss it, yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's the issue we're gonna have. If we're gonna, if we're gonna promote this kind of infill, we have to be cognizant of, of just the things we talked about. Before. When I first, the, my first interaction with the planning board I actually came here and was speaking against against the project that was right in, right next to my house. Um, now I still think it's unattractive, but it's it's, it's fine. Um, but I, the the thing that, that hit me then and still hits me now is that there's not it's like the the aesthetic choice versus versus the rules that it can be done. It's almost like. I feel like the board needs some sort of objective aesthetic component to help to help balance. Well, DPW says it's okay, so it's okay. Right. You know, it's like, I mean, that's it's hard to do. I mean, because it's honestly, it's not fair. It's not fair for me to be like, oh, I don't like how it looks. Right. So, but it is. That is, we are the representing the people, the town. The, you know the residents as well as the city. I mean, we're uh, that is our role. But but you have the dis you we, we've had the discussion over over the years where you have a modern house, a very modern house, next to a colonial house. Yep. Some people say, well, I, I don't like the way it looks, but it meets all the parameters. And then you say, well, who is that? The planning board's purview to say, well, we don't like the way it looks either, or it doesn't. Then, if then you take out the language out of out of well, the. The rule. Well, special so permit, it gives you, I mean, it's you know, just, it's it's just a slippery slope. And, and well, but except I don't think we have to talk about aesthetics exactly. It's, it can be a different aesthetic than the rest in the neighborhood, but be not in scale, well, not, not right. harmonious. It's the scale that yeah, you're, you're right. right, right, it's right. It's the right, scale. Right, right. That's right. absolutely aesthetics, right. Aesthetics, I'm actually going to harmonious rather than aesthetics. I really yeah. care less about the architecture, per se, mm -hmm. as much as the 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 harmonious that's integration. What, that's what I mean. I mean, I, I would on, just love to have some sort of is so inharmonious. Yeah, yeah. Right. Every right at the corner, right across from the Y. Oh, oh yes, yes. That's, that's, I mean, right. it is. I mean, it's arch architecture. Fine, the scale and it's just You're talking about the slanted roof. The yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. it's it, it's an eyesore, in my opinion, because it doesn't right fit. Right across the street from you. So, but it ha and that has a bigger massing on the street than, than the one you're talking about. So what about it isn't? Har I mean, why wouldn't that be considered in our? Because it looms. Because next to the those other houses, across the street are all more or less the same. That house, in the context of the street that it. I forget what it's called. A dare, dare place. Dare. Back to design, and this yeah. gets it completely yeah. dwarfs and rises above everything else. It blocks light. I don't know. Just all of it. I mean, I don't. It's not. I said Prospect. That's because where it's located. Maybe its address is a dare. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think of it as the house on Prospect. It's not necessarily inharmonious with Prospect houses, but the Adair houses, I think, are stuck with something. For the rest, uh, for eternity, until that house falls apart, which it won't, because it's made out of cement, cement board. Um, the, the, the one on on Route Nine that we're referring to, I think, is a clearer case, because architecturally it blends in. It's just twice the, the, the size. Right. Yeah, it's the scale. Right. And it you know when you look. 
I, I was really surprised. Uh, I don't think, I don't remember the facade of that house. I remember the footprint. Mm -hmm. And it's the facade of the house, which is to say the mass of it, that now I'm aware of, right. rather than the footprint. Right. Well, it sticks out in every direction. Mm -hmm. and somehow, I mean, I agree, we can't, I don't think we can say, I don't like the yeah. colors or the right. architecture no, or the like detail. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you can't say it's I know. <laughs> but that'll change. You know, somebody else will buy it, it'll become red, which yeah. we won't like either. Yeah. <laughs> but somehow it seems that this is an issue that we haven't adequately paid attention to. Yeah. Well, I think a single house like that is one thing. Um, but if we're actively promoting infill, I think that's another. And so if you have a house and then you're putting a house next to that house or a house behind that house, then I think that, that the context of that discussion is different than if somebody buys a, or has an empty lot and builds a house that people are uncomfortable with. It meets all the zoning or heights yeah. and setbacks, yeah, right. but they think it's too modern or too, the, the roof line is not you know, in keeping with others. Um, it's harder. It's harder that way. It's, it's well, the infill does complicate this the tremendously, does complicate and and mm -hmm. the board. I mean, this. I think the city and the board are being viewed as being not responsive the to the needs of the citizenry, and it's being we're being very responsive to the needs of the city in terms of you know utilities and all of that. But every time we do this, we end up really creating a nest of unhappy people uh, surrounding it mm -hmm. and it's you know at some point it, it's gonna I think it's gonna backfire and then we'll end up having to rewrite the whole thing mm -hmm. or eliminate it which maybe is where we're gonna head to um, but it does it does feel like like we have rolled over at times when we shouldn't have and, and I, this I, I'm going to do as much research as I can before the next one to make a presentation well, that hopefully will make some sense yeah. to... In the case of that one on Route 9, not to beat it to death, but I remember the discussion. And I, I, I even remember commenting to the architect or whatever that I liked the design. And I was just wrong. I mean, yeah. somehow I missed the fact that it was going to be this elephant-sized structure. Because uh, what we were looking at was, it was footprint. Oh, it yeah. was uh, that's what I remember about that thing entirely, rather than scale. Or well, even the elevations of the house, unless it's in context with the houses right, around right. it. Yeah, you see, you it. see it, and it's oh, that looks nice. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a value. I mean, one of the things that I've found in our, is using sort of a Google Map thing mm. right here yeah. just to understand what mm -hmm. what we're really. Well, but yeah. it's hard to do that. At, um, and with a vacant lot yeah, and no. see what right, it's right, going right. to look like. Yeah. But we could, you know, one of the things I think that would improve our decision-making process is that for any infill project that would occur that we would require views from that the neighbors might see. Yeah. So before, so that we would see some rendition, architectural, um, that would show what all the abutters would see. Mm -hmm as well as what you might see across the street. So we can actually say, yeah, no, this doesn't fit. Or, yeah, it's yeah. okay. It's not, you know. Can we do that somehow? Require, it, is there a name for that? that oh, yeah, you can ask for um, perspectives from, um, you know, north, south, east, or west, depending on the orientation of the project. Show the elevation. Oh, look at it, too. Right, in context oh, with what's around it, right? Look at it, I do. Yeah, yeah, you should all do that. I asked but the applicant to do that in this scenario. I mean, I'm not trying to go into the detail, but you did get an additional, or you should have had in your packet, where it was just a slight purple line sort of showing where oh, the structure right. was. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, That was their attempt at responding to my request that they do that. Like, you know, what is this going to look like from the street? Really put it, put it, put a Photoshop it, basically. Right. So, yes, we can require that. Um, Maybe in matters of infill, we should make that a standard request. We could put that so as a submittal requirement. It, unless it's part of the application, shouldn't we? Right, but we, right, can but, change, but we can identify that on the website for the application material. Yeah. So when you're applying. Um, so then at staff level, when they get it, they say, oh, you need perspectives yeah. so that 
we can see it in context. Right. I think that's a good idea. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, the Central Business Architecture Committee has, uh, has that as a sort of standing requirement for projects that come in mm -hmm. um, to the CB. And that's more like infill. Yeah. Right, so that makes sense. Anything downtown, we need perspectives. We could say anything infill, we need perspectives. Yeah. And are there guidelines for what that would include? Could you just do, you know, a purple crayon on a photo well, or? you can make that guideline, yes. I mean, certainly with. But um, is there a guideline? Does the central, does the architectural committee have those guidelines? Can we just yeah, adopt yeah. those? Sure. All right. And you don't necessarily need to adopt them. Like, I can pull up the standards and run it by you, say, are you comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. And it's not something that has to be an ordinance. It can mm -hmm. just go on the web page and say, you need, you know, applicants mm -hmm. need yeah. to process it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and could you bring that next time? Or? Can we require that? <laughs> of, um, that for this continuous, continuance, obviously, because they're not going to be real well, we we could ask yeah. them. Really? Yeah. yeah, because you're, sure. you've are you asked them to go away. They've heard your comments, and for you to understand exactly what's being proposed, so we they're providing that. you with new information. They would be dumb not to I do would, what we ask that. for Just in the, terms yeah. of yeah. Yeah. making yeah, it that desirable. One thing on a street, They want it to be uh, desired. So yeah. To show one house, two house, three houses, the applicant, the... Uh, with this where it's in back, which right. perspective is yeah. Because here, if you're standing right in front of the house looking at it, you, you can't yeah. see yeah, it, or what you see it. is, right. it's just when you turn hard it around, to, and all of a sudden. But yeah. they, they also, you don't know what they're gonna submit. They may, you know, bring the whole thing up, you know, closer to the street. I, I, we just don't right. know. So yeah. that's where I can just let Hopefully them know. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly they had some other idea. Yeah. Hmm. Like, I including hope threatening could. putting a massive and but the building, right. Yeah. <laughs> Put the metal structure there. Exactly. Right. Because that yeah, would where, yeah. where it's be around <laughs> the RV, it would be one story. This is, we, yeah. Because we're still, we're still o our meeting's still open right now, so. Yeah. 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 All right, let's close the meeting. All right. Okay. Well, anyway, anyway let's let's talk about about seeing the house we've been talking about, should yeah. I buy it? Can you? Yes. Um, no, I want to. Oh. We had a motion to adjourn by somebody about 15 minutes ago and second. All in favor? So we're closed. We're